A dear pet passed yesterday, so today I'm going to take it easy with some of my favorite kinds of stories. This is a compilation of hiking horror stories I've read in the past. Enjoy, everyone. If you want your story narrated, send it to us at darkstories.org. I am planning some episodes on encounters in the Ozarks and stories from the Appalachian or Rocky Mountains as soon as I get enough stories. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. The Count's Birdcage From the Woodsman Location, Poland I worked a small-time park maintenance and upkeep job a few years back for a local park. It was no Yellowstone, but I grew up there hiking the hills and exploring the forests. When I got offered a job working there, I took it without a second thought even though it didn't really pay well. Just my way of giving back to the park. I have more than a few stories from my time there, trekking about with a shovel and saw for whole days at a time. But my favorite tale comes from a co-worker of mine, who I knew as Michael. Michael had a particular nickname among my fellow crewmen, The Count. This was, as far as I could tell, in reference to his angular European face and dark black hair. The Count was around 50 or so when I met him, and yet he had such love for the forest that he stayed in his part-time volunteer job. The Count was a very kind and gentle man. He would help out with anything you asked, was always kind and compassionate. Of all the things I remember about the Count, one thing that always stuck with me was his love of telling tales of adventures from his home country of Poland. His passion for those stories are part of why I record them and spread them as much as I do today. The Count told, no pun intended, countless stories, and many of them I can recall somewhat. Only one of them has really stuck with me all these years later, and it was the last story he ever told me. The Count was soon to leave his job in this area of the country. He began to tell me one last tale. Like I said, the Count was from Poland, and he moved to the US in 97, following the tragic passing of his girlfriend and his child in 94. Such an event really shook him. I could see the sadness in his eyes when he talked about it in detail, recollecting his story late one night in the maintenance garage. To settle his nerves, Michael relocated to the rural areas of Poland, found himself a small job as a forester, and settled down. The town he had ended up in was very small, with a population of less than 200, shrouded by a deep forest. Michael had worked with a lumber and forestry company that operated out of the village, and was granted a small shared house along with his fellow workers and strict manager. He was by far no stranger to the woods. He had camped and hiked there his entire life. As Michael began to fall into the repetition of his logging job, he found hiking and exploring his work area to be what really helped him ease his mind. He spent countless dark nights alone, roaming the forest in search of answers to his questions, taking solace in the silent trees and bright stars. It was where he felt the safest, where he felt the most relaxed. The Count had mentioned finding odd buildings and structures in the forests before, but never anything like this. He said he remembered the night clear as ever, a crisp fall night full of the chirping of bugs and the sounds of trees, wind blowing through them. He began to walk down the same dirt path that he took nearly every night prior, and when he reached a point where he could break off to explore a new unseen region, he entered into the brush and undergrowth. Most of the night was unremarkable, he said, until around 2 a.m. That's when the trees began to clear away. There, within the open meadow he had never seen before, was an ancient, rusting structure. It had a concrete base, rather wide and flat, that lay around the main structure of a silo-sized cage of welded bars. The whole thing was clearly very odd and very old, beginning to collapse, 
even having several large holes in the frame. Michael was, of course, interested, and as he began to advance on the cage, the smell hit him. The Count described it as like a rotting animal and vegetables mixed, strong enough to be noticeable from 40 feet away. When he made it to the concrete base of the towering structure, he climbed up and things did not seem right. The floor was stained a dark reddish brown and splotches all over, and large black feathers littered the inside of the cage. Crates and other miscellaneous objects lay strewn about the foundation, all left sitting perfectly, as if they hadn't been left there for years. Michael only took a few steps forward when he accidentally kicked over a small oil can, making a loud and sudden crash. But it soon resonated that the object was not nearly large enough to make that loud of a noise. He began to scan the area with his small light and did not see anything around. He had began to stifle his nerves when he looked up. Perched high above Michael in the upper area of the cage was a massive creature. It was covered with sleek black feathers and set between its shoulders was a human head. It took the Count more than a few tries to get this out. As he told the story, he was sort of stammering, as if he were reliving the very moment right in front of me. He went on to describe how the thing opened its mouth wide, wider than anything ought to be able to, in order to release a loud bird call. Michael turned and fled, crying out and running back into the trees. He could hear the unmistakable sound of the huge bird leave its position on the structure and flying over the treetops. He fled through the forest, back down his trail, and towards the logging camp. As he broke through the trees in a panic, Michael began to feel woozy and found himself struggling to run. He realized he was about to black out, and right before his vision went dark, he saw his manager exit the front door of the lodge in a hurry, shouldering a weapon and aiming it towards Michael before firing. Michael woke up a day later in his bed. He was alone in the lodge and didn't see any of his co-workers. He examined the area and found a note left on his dresser addressed to him from his manager. I know what you've seen. It's come here before. I've kept it at bay until last night. For your safety, you're no longer under our employment. Pack your things and vacate. You must never speak of what you saw last night or I will find you. You're best off forgetting that it ever happened. The Count described leaving the same day, faced with stares from his co-workers. He was so shaken... From there, he moved home, and after a short while, moved to America. When the Count finished the story, I could tell just how upset he was. He was nearly in tears and may have even been shaking slightly. I didn't want him to go on. I could see so much stress in him as he told the story, but he kept speaking on that night. I know what I saw that night, he forced out to me in a quiet tone. It's called a Latviak. It's a demon of sorts. At this point, tears rolled down his face. But the demons are... They're the spirits of Okboze. He trailed off in Polish. I told him it was okay. He didn't have to continue. He thanked me for listening to his story grabbed his toolbox and coat, and then he left. But that was the last time I ever spoke to him. What really terrifies me the most about this experience isn't what the Count told me that chilly night in the garage, but what happened soon after. I remembered how Michael could not bring himself to tell me what a Latviak was. When I researched it, I knew why. Latviak is a Polish demon of the harmful type, believed to be the souls of lost children and the recently passed. It 
horrifies me to the core to imagine that what the Count saw that night was the demonic manifestation of his own child. As I said before, I have not spoken to the Count since. I know it's a long shot, but I know he always loved scary stories. So Michael, if somehow this reaches you, I'm so sorry, and I will keep you in my thoughts. Goblin in El Yunque from Rico S. Location, Puerto Rico. This incident happened to my family in the mid-1960s while visiting El Yunque, a national forest in Puerto Rico. This story is the reason why, if I ever decide to visit El Yunque or any forest for that matter, I will act very, very cautious. I'll start with my grandmother. Since my grandmother was a child, she always wanted to visit El Yunque. It was famous for its pristine waterfalls and for being the largest nature reserve in the island of Puerto Rico. Years later, after she was married to my grandfather, they took a trip with my dad, who was then a teenager, along with my aunts and my second cousins. After a great day of hiking and bathing in the springs, my second cousin Myra, who was about four at the time, was playing near the hiking trails that left the spring El Baño. My grandmother happened to look her way when she noticed a small humanoid thing staring at my cousin from behind a bush. My grandmother said the hideous creature made eye contact with her. My grandmother was startled and screamed at everyone to get my cousin Myra. My father jumped at my grandmother's sudden reaction, then looked to where she was pointing and saw the humanoid creature as well. It suddenly ran away, disappearing into the forest, but my father gave chase. Though smaller, the creature ran much faster than him and soon parted through the brush and disappeared. He mentioned that the thing left a trail of pushed over plants and broken vegetation. My grandmother then quickly told everyone to pack up. They left El Yunque and never went back. I asked my grandmother what the creature looked like. She said it was small, humanoid, and brown in color. It had a garment-like thing of brown leather attached to it. Its face had a sinister look. It was scheming and wicked. The thing is, El Yunque is known for lots of disappearances and plenty of mysterious events. These days, I don't really have an interest in visiting the place, as my friends who have gone there have told me it's a very solitary and eerie place. Could Dragons Be Real? From Sad Hanzo, Maine. Location, Oregon. About a month ago, I went with a group of friends from college to go hiking in the Cascade Mountains in Oregon, right in the Crater Lake National Park area. The trip through the mountain ranges was fun and quite the workout. Toward the end of our little vacation, we decided to cross through the Crater Lake area to take in the view and see the blue waters for ourselves. We arrived in the lake area late in the day and decided to set up camp close to the lake shore. That night, the six of us had a great time, talking, sharing stories. Other than a scare from some two curious possums looking for food, the night was relaxing, and soon we all went to sleep, exhausted from the long day's trek. Around sunrise, we began waking and preparing our meal for the coming day. As we sat around our campfire, eating in the early dawn light, we began hearing a whooshing sound, followed by the sound of trees rustling. We all went quiet. We were looking around when a large shadow fell upon our group as a massive creature flew overhead. As the creature flew by us, I took in the features I could see. It looked to be about the size of one of those mid-sized lair jets. It had two massive wings, 
four legs and a long tail that had what looked like fins about midway down its length. Its neck was long, but not serpentine, and its head was at least the size of a large car. It flew off towards the lake, more so towards Wizard Island, but instead of landing on the island, it dove straight into the water. It took a good moment for our group to recover from the shock and fear of what we had just seen. But soon we were packed and moving swiftly to get out of that park. As we walked, we were silent, no one wanting to put words to what we saw. Not 15 minutes after setting out, the sound of something breaking through the surface of the water and a loud screech resounded, echoing from the direction of the lake and through the forest. It was terrifying. Most of our group immediately threw themselves into the tree line to hide. Logan, the oldest of the group, and I just stood there, transfixed in awe and fear as that creature burst from the surface of the lake taking off once again into the air, then flying off to the other side of the lake until it was out of sight. After our group left and parted ways, I went home and looked up dragon sightings in the area, but I didn't find a thing. Maybe it was a group hallucination. Maybe it just happened to be the world's biggest bird that we all mistook for something different. Either way, if you're planning on going out to the Crater Lake area of Oregon, keep your eyes on the sky. My Encounter with the Jersey Devil From Silverwolf69 Location, New Jersey I've been interested in hiking for a long time. After middle school, I actually had more time to do that than less even with high school work. During the break, I visited one of my friends in New Jersey for his 16th birthday. His parents got him a new camera with night vision and video recording capabilities, so I suggested that we test it out. More than any other place, he wanted to go to the Pine Barrens. It's so dark and tree-covered, he said. I can really see how good this thing works there. I agreed with him, and I followed him in. Now, I wish I hadn't. That afternoon, I kept hearing twigs snapping and branches moaning or creaking, leaves rustling around us. I brought each occurrence up to my friend, who insisted that it was just the wind and the effects of the earth settling, or small animals like chipmunks. Considering he had lived in the state his whole life, I figured he knew what he was talking about. As we continued to go deeper into the woods, I kept getting the strange feeling like I was being watched. I remember joking. I hope it's not Bigfoot. But instead of a laugh, my friend replied by stopping and turning to look at me. I asked him what the problem was, and he replied, Bigfoot isn't here. This is Jersey Devil territory. I realized then that this was probably why he suggested the Pine Barrens after all. He wanted to catch a glimpse of the devil itself. At the time, I was really into cryptozoology and the supernatural. I carried this little book full of different creatures and urban legends. I pulled it out and remembered a page that had the Jersey Devil on it, along with an illustration, one that was too bizarre to be anything more than someone's imagination. I showed it to him. Oh, come on, do you really believe that a creature like this exists? He was about to answer, but stopped when he began staring at something behind me. He quickly whipped out his camera and tried to record it, but he said he missed it. He told me to follow him so he could find out what it was. As soon as the two of us took off, I heard something overhead again. I looked up, but I did not see whatever made the noise. My friend was really starting to freak out too. At the time, I was creeped out, but I was sure that we had just spooked ourselves from the prior conversation. But we then saw something unlike anything we'd ever seen before. It was seven feet tall and skeletal, hardly any flesh on its bones. Even the wings were like thin bones. It was perched atop one of the bare trees, looking down at us like it was curious 
Suddenly, my friend screamed and took off faster than I'd ever seen him run before in the opposite direction. Without a word, I followed. I heard a strange call from behind me, but I dared not look back. As soon as we reached the edge of the Pine Barrens, we saw two people entering and immediately told them, that's not a good idea. They turned around and left, taking our warning or just being creeped out by a couple of kids being out of breath and coming running out of the forest. I don't go to New Jersey much anymore, but if I ever pass the Pine Barrens again, I'll know there's something in there. Something not natural, and it's waiting and watching. The Thing on the River From Here Comes That Boy Location Unknown You should always be careful when you go camping. It was late April. My grandfather and I were going camping on the river. We took his boat, which was an airboat with a six-cylinder Lycoming engine and a 12-foot hull we got to the campsite, which was just an island on the river. We called the place Shell Island because there were loads of snail shells. We set up camp and got finished at around 11 a.m. We decided to go riding the river. When we got back, it must have been around 6 p.m. We stayed up in the tent until about 8 p.m. Then we got back in the boat and grabbed the frog gigs and put on our lights. We gigged frogs until about 12 a.m., then we headed back to camp. At around two or three, I was awakened by movement outside. I looked over to my grandfather who was beside me. He was sound asleep, so it wasn't him. Now this was a very isolated island. You either get here by boat or hike about 80 miles. So we had to have been the only campers here. I knew deep down, that this was no person, because I would have heard the boat come to shore. But listening more closely, whatever it was, didn't even sound like a person. It was walking on hooves instead of feet, and no deer was as big as this thing was. It sounded like it was 600 pounds. We were in Florida, and the biggest deer I've ever seen personally was 200 pounds tops. As for bears, they don't have hooves, I quietly tried to look through the tent. I made out a shape that was something on two legs, but compared to a person, its joints were backwards, like a cat's or cow legs, and it stood quite tall, about nine or ten feet. Suddenly, it turned its head towards me, looking at my face through the opening of the tent. My heart sank when I saw its eyes. They were sort of glowing white, I zipped back up the flap, laid back down, and pretended to sleep. I prayed that that creature was not here for us. When morning came, I dragged my grandfather out of the tent to show him the prints on the ground. He seemed perplexed, and he didn't really say anything, but we left early that day. I think both of us were quite spooked. Something in the Snow, from Tatiana, location, Switzerland. My family and I live in Lochendal, a relatively isolated side valley in the canton of Valais, Switzerland. As of recently, we've had an abundant amount of snow cutting off the entire valley from any civilization this apparently happened quite often back in the day and was always a reason for some scary stories to originate. My father had been trapped outside due to not being able to leave work as they announced that the road was going to close. Luckily, I was allowed to leave my gymnasium during a Latin exam, which is usually not the case. So thanks to whoever convinced our principal to let us go, I would catch the last train that was going to be allowed passage so it was just my mother, 12-year-old sister, and me at home, an all-female household, for now at least. 
A few days later, the first supply helicopter arrived, and I was to go down into the village to get our share of it. I had to go because my sister was too young and my mother's knee was acting up again. It would probably be worth it to mention that we live a bit outside the village and the walk down would take about an hour. All of that in knee deep or even hip deep snow at some points. So I went down into the cellar to get the snowshoes to make it at least a bit easier to walk. I emptied my school backpack so I'd have something to carry our stuff back in then put on my snowwear and snowshoes. Off I was. The first three quarters of the hike were pretty uneventful. I could already make out the smoke coming from the village, and to my delight, the street was cleaned from here on out. I was glad to finally be able to walk without snowshoes again. I looked back up the way I came down just moments ago and saw something that resembled a chagata, hip deep in snow, a chakata is something that is kind of a tradition here around carnival. Single men would wear fur and a scary looking mask, then go around smearing people's faces with coal. I thought it was just some guy pulling a prank on me at first, so I continued walking, looking over every so often to see the chakata come closer and closer. That's when I saw it. Eyes, nose, and mouth of what I presumed to be a mask but they were moving. If it was a mask, they definitely should not be able to move, as usually Chiganta masks were wooden. This freaked me out. I began to walk faster, casting sidelong glances to check if it was still following me. And it was. It was gaining on me, getting closer steadily, too close for comfort. Even though it was half submerged in snow, it was keeping pace and gaining. I needed to get away from it. I started running, and as soon as I broke into a sprint, I could hear snow crunching hard behind me. I didn't dare look back. I knew that it was pursuing me. It was a struggle just to keep from falling on my face on the slippery road. I heard a terrifying sound from behind me, a growl or yelp of some kind. It didn't sound happy that I was getting away from it. I sprinted all the way down to the village, ignoring everything around me, never even thinking about my stamina. Somehow, I reached the place they were handing out the supplies, and only then did I stop. I guess I felt safe with other people around. I fell to the ground, gasping for air before pulling myself together again and retrieving our share of things though I did not for the life of me want to walk home alone. Luck was on my side now, as I caught sight of my father's friend, Yosef, who just so happened to be the one clearing the snow from the street. I was able to hitch a ride from him. The normal 60-minute hike was reduced to a three-minute drive, and I was indefinitely grateful. I still am not sure of what I saw. Was it just a tasteless prank? or something more sinister. Samudiva Siding 2 From Alexander Location, Bulgaria I shared a story with you all in 2016 about the spirits called Samudiva. That was back in October of 2016 but now I have a second experience about them. This happened just a few days ago. My friends and I usually do a nighttime mountain hike to two peaks of a mountain in Bulgaria. The peaks are a few kilometers apart. There's nothing between them but natural plain with tall grass, bushes, and a few forested areas. Just after the first peak, there's an old cottage where an old man acts as a rescuer for hikers in distress. He's a spry old dog who walks faster than us, even in his 70s, and we, by the way, are in our mid-20s. Me and the two of my friends reach the first peak at around 11 p.m. It's 1,800 meters above sea level and is completely covered by large boulders. It overlooks a city, and we reveled in the beauty of the city lights for about an hour. Then we ate and continued down the mountaintop, now towards the higher 2,300 meter peak which was five kilometers ahead of us. We walked for about 40 minutes when we reached the cottage, 
but unlike before, there was no one in it. The lights were out and the door was shut. Strange, we thought. The old man is here all the time. What's going on? Out of nowhere, we heard the agonizing cry of an injured animal. The heck was that? One of my friends asked. I don't know. We should keep going, the other replied. I think we should just stay here for now. Whatever's causing that noise, I don't want to be outside and meet it, I insisted. But my argument lost. After a few minutes of discussion, we continued to our destination on foot. If only they'd listened. We came across the side of the noise we heard, but it wasn't just one animal. There were rabbits, coyotes, birds, and rodents all over, just piled up, all with the same finger-wide wounds in their rib cages. Guys, I think we should go downhill to the resorts, I said. Agreed, the two of them said in unison. All of a sudden, I felt an arm on my face and I jerked it away from me, turning around. It was just the old man, but his face was white and his eyes were wide open. He put a finger to his mouth to shush us and pointed to the direction of the forest. We saw four of the creatures that I had talked about so long ago. My heart sank. I remember thinking, not again. My friends saw them too as I watched their jaws drop. What in the world are those? One of them asked. We need to move, now, I screamed. We were picking up speed when we noticed that the old man was hurt. My friends picked him up and started walking quickly to the cottage. Then we heard them. They sounded like an old woman's laugh and a scream just after it, and I could hear footsteps in the snow. We ran, faster than we ever had before, but one of my friends fell over, stumbling upon a rock. I turned around, ready to rescue my friend and face them, and immediately, I heard an echoing voice. I think it was in my head, but I know it was coming from them, the Samodiva. and didn't hear my friends yelling at me. I don't know how, but we were already at the cottage. I stared at them, wide-eyed, frozen in my position. My hand was shaking. They opened the door, and one of my friends pulled me by the shoulder inside. We got in, locked the place down, and covered the two windows with pieces of furniture. I sat down on the floor and realized that I had soiled myself. The Samodiva were outside the entire night, pushing, clawing, hitting at the walls and the doors. We didn't get a wink of sleep that night, and we left midday the next day, terrified. We're never going to those mountains again. Voices in the Snow From Bruce Location Idaho this story begins on my walk home from my best friend's house. We live deep in the mountains of Idaho, where each home can be up to five miles apart. It was late December, and even though I was walking on the road, the snow was several inches deep and falling steadily. In order to get to my house, I had to hike through the dense forest for almost two miles. It was around seven in the evening, so the sky had fallen dark leaving the only light to be reflecting off the snow. My friends and I have hiked these trails for years and are extremely familiar with it, even in the dark. After cutting off the old logging road and into the dark forest, I began to hear heavy footfalls coming from the hauler off to my right. Thinking it was just some woodland critter, such as a deer or a moose, as they are heavily populated in this area, I thought nothing of it and kept on my way. Although the footsteps still followed, keeping pace with me as I headed up the mountain towards my home, I began to feel as if eyes were watching my every move from behind the tall pines lining the trail. After living here so long, I knew that no wild animal would take this much interest in a person, so I began to quicken my pace. 
That's when the deep, muffled voice came from the dark. Hello? With confusion, I left the trail to try and see if there was someone who needed help, but just out of eyesight. I called out to it. Is someone there? However, I was left with just silence. Hoping it was just the wind and a trick of my mind, I made my way back to the trail. Thumping footsteps continued to follow my every step, forcing me to quicken my pace again. Suddenly, the snap of a large tree branch forced me to stop. I turned around and I tried to find what had made the noise. That's when I saw the furry, black hands reaching around from behind a small tree. The figure stood seven feet tall and easily overtook the mass of the tree. I blinked repeatedly to make sure my eyes weren't playing tricks on me. I took two steps back, and the creature in response took a step in my direction. Its long arm came out away from its body, with its palm up like a person does to greet a dog. I quickly screamed, then turned to sprint up the rest of the trail to my house, where I then quickly ran inside, slamming and locking the door behind me. I was too afraid to check the windows. I was home alone at the time, so I quickly ran to my parents' empty bedroom to grab a flashlight. I made my way to the balcony on the top floor of the three-story home. I made my way to the railing, then I shone the flashlight in the direction of the trailhead, easily seen from the north side of the house. Immediately, dark yellow eyes reflected back through the darkness. I screamed at it to go away, but the creature only moved from behind the forest to the edge of the tree line, where its full mass could be seen reflecting in the flashlight's beam. My body froze with complete terror as my eyes adjusted to see the full grin and rows of teeth of this monster. With a grin on its face, it turned its large back on me and walked slowly and confidently into the forest, disappearing into the dark. I walked back inside, locked the doors in my parents' room, and eventually passed out. I never walked that trail alone at night again. Even to this day, I still feel those yellow eyes peering at me from the darkness whenever I have to walk even a few yards out to the barn to feed the horses. Return of the Bubba Jacks From J.M. Location, Ohio It's found me again, the creature that I encountered six years ago. I'm 25 years old and live in Ohio near the border of West Virginia. My house is a few blocks from the main road, secluded in the middle of a dense forest. When I was 19, I encountered a creature that I call the Bubba Jacks, and I lost a good friend of mine. Now, six years later, that monster has found me. It started when I heard voices coming from the woods at night, or rather Jonah's voice, the voice of the friend who I assume was taken by the Bubba Jacks. But the voice was hollow and not like the voice I remember. At first, I thought I was going crazy, but then the sounds came from below my bedroom window. After the first incident, I checked my front door camera. I couldn't see anything but darkness. The only odd thing was a bit of glinting to the right of the video, maybe one of two huge white eyes, or maybe I'm being paranoid. I called my friend Seth, who knew of my first encounter. I told him that it was back, and I told him we were going on a bit of a hike. Later that day, Seth met me outside my house, armed. We sat outside all night, hoping to see something but saw nothing. Even Jonah's voice stayed quiet. The following day, I decided to check the porch camera again. What I saw terrified me. I saw me and Seth walking around outside, basically patrolling, but I saw a very tall and dark silhouette. It stood in the corner and seemed to watch us. I called Seth and I told him we need to go again but he was flying out of the country that day, so I would be alone that night. 
I stayed close to the house with the porch light on so I could see anything that tried to sneak up on me. About an hour in, I heard a rustle in the bushes, followed by struggling noises and a pained cry. I ran into the trees, gripping my weapon tightly. I ran fast for a few seconds, then slowed as I realized that I could be taking the bait. It was too late. I had already come up on a small clearing, and I saw the thin frame of that creature. Its back faced me as it knelt before a fresh prey. It didn't notice me as it tore away at its flesh. I was too afraid to turn my back on it and run. So I aimed at it. I fired, but it went clean through the shoulder. The Bubba Jack stopped. It made no movement, no sound. It was entirely still. Then it slowly turned its head to face me, still knelt on the ground. Its eyes glimmered and red flowed from its mouth. It stared at me, a low growl erupting from its throat. It stood and continued to stare. Then it brought up its huge black hands and showed me its palms. Carved into each of them was a symbol. And then it faded from my sight, like a transitioning photo in a slideshow or something. I was going mad, wasn't I? A week later, during the day, Seth and I were out hunting in the same forest. He had just come back from his trip. We hiked in very deep and noticed something was off about the trees. We realized then that they were in rows, like they had been planted, but we were so deep in the forest that it didn't seem likely that they belonged to a company, but we had no idea who would come out here and plant trees in rows like this. I do not know if the planted trees had anything to do with the Bubba Jacks, but it was definitely odd. I'll be moving soon, and hopefully I no longer have to deal with this. For our final story, it's another blast from the past, a tale I shared with you in 2017 that more than likely you haven't heard yet. Enjoy Long Walks from Lola E. I live in Portland, and as some of you may know, there are loads of great hiking trails in our city. I enjoy walking them on lonely nights to get some peace of mind. It can be a stress reliever. I especially like the trails by small rivers. I mean, listening to the rushing of water can intensify that feeling of serenity, that feeling you get when you're alone in the woods. About a year back, I decided I wanted to hike one of those trails. I had gotten into an argument with my boyfriend and I needed to do something to put my mind at ease. I was 22 at the time. Before that night, I had walked the trail I was going to plenty of times and nothing ever happened, nothing out of the ordinary that is. Despite knowing this, I always brought a pocket knife with me just in case. I can be a very paranoid or cautious person let me try to describe the entrance of this trail. It's been about a year since I've been there, so my memory might be a little rough. There's a lot of grass, a huge open clearing surrounded by woods. Behind you are a bunch of houses, and above you is an old rusty green bridge. There's some kind of modern art inspired statue on the right of the pathway that leads to the trail. At the time, I believe it was nine or 10 o'clock at night. I was almost excited to get lost in the sounds and sights of the woods that night, and I began to walk down the trail alone. My destination was the old stone house-like structure located close to the top of the trail. Some people call it the witch's hut. I know that's what I called it when I was a kid. It was covered in graffiti and moss, and the inside smells like pee. After 10 or 20 minutes of walking at a fast pace, I reached the building Nothing strange had happened up until that point, but I did have this overwhelming feeling of being watched. I caught myself constantly looking back as I walked the trail, but I never heard anything odd aside from the occasional hooting of an owl. I hadn't seen anything particularly odd either. I sat on a log outside the witch's hut and behind me was a drop off covered in bushes and vines and at the bottom was a small river. I had been facing the hut before I whipped around, startled by a sudden rustling noise that came from below. 
I looked down, squinting at the river below me. And I kid you not, something came darting out of the bushes from one side and into a bush on the side closest to mine. I didn't know what the heck that thing was, but it somehow managed to scale the cliff in a split second, and I watched it dart around the back of the hut. This all happened so fast, I didn't even have time to react. My heart felt like it was about to explode out of my chest, and I could barely make out any of the thing's features, and I didn't think I really wanted to. My flight instinct kicked into high gear as I sprinted away down the trail. It sounded like there was a second pair of smaller, lighter footsteps in rhythm with my own. This boosted my adrenaline by 10 times or so. My body couldn't keep up that running for much longer. I hadn't heard the footsteps for a few minutes and I decided to stop and turn around. And that was a huge mistake. Whatever that thing was, it was sitting on a decaying tree stump, staring at me in complete silence. It sat like a dog, but it had the body of a human. Its elbows bent outwards and it had no hands. Its eyes were two tiny close together yellow dots and its head was small and oval. It had no hair and it was a deep purple color. I felt like I was staring at it and it was staring at me for hours. Neither of us moved a muscle. It was so crazy and terrifying, I honestly thought I had been imagining things until it freaking blinked. I finally regained my common sense and I turned the other way and bolted. I don't think I had ever run that fast in my whole life. When I reached the bottom of the trail, I didn't stop running, heck no. I leapt into my car and rolled up all the windows and I stared at that thing one last time. And before my windows were up, I heard the thing hoot like an owl, just like the owls I had heard on the way to the witch hut. Then this creature turned around and leapt back into the woods, and then there was a flash of white light that came from the forest, and then a low humming noise. It was like nothing I'd ever heard of before. Needless to say, I didn't stick around to find out what it was. I haven't told this story to many, in fear that they'll think I'm crazy or something. I honestly don't know what that thing was. It was almost otherworldly. Owl creature or whatever you were, let's not meet again. I didn't really like my stepdad. He wasn't a bad guy, I just didn't know him very well. And he took my dad's place, which didn't really sit well in my head or my heart. You see, my dad died while exercising one day. He was an avid jogger. He seemed so healthy to everyone, but the next thing we knew, an ambulance was driving down the street, racing to my dad's lifeless body. I believe it was an aneurysm. Not really sure what caused it, though. A couple of years later, my mom, being lonely, found someone new someone I didn't want to accept. Craig was a nice guy. He was in his early 50s, loved playing video games with my brother and sister, and he took every opportunity he had to try to bond with me. But I wasn't ready to open up yet. Not even when my mom offered that the two of us take a weekend to go hiking in the mountains. She'd been wanting Craig to get more in shape, he wasn't nearly as in shape as my dad. Then again, neither was I. But I did enjoy the outdoors. Craig obliged, but I was hesitant. Imagining just how awkward it was going to be, just me and Craig out in the woods, it didn't sound too fun. One night when my mom pulled me aside after dinner, she begged me to go with him. I was 17 years old, and I would be graduating next year, moving out of state for college. She dreaded the idea of the two of us not knowing each other very well, not getting along. So to make her happy, we began planning a trip to the mountains. It was nearly fall, right before school started back up. We were carrying big bags equipped with a tent, some flashlights, batteries, 
fire starters because we weren't going to be able to do that castaway style. Craig had also gone shopping and bought some MREs and a bunch of astronaut treats, those freeze-dried ice cream bars and candy bars and such. He thought it'd be fun to pig out on them the first night, after we got a camp set up, of course. To be quite honest, seeing him so excited to go hiking with me, it really helped me loosen up on the trip. We soon pulled up at the start of the hiking trail on a Friday evening. It was a couple of hours until sundown, but there were plenty of places along the trail to camp at, so we weren't worried about not being able to find a spot fast enough. As we were unloading the gear from the truck, another truck pulled up next to us. A father and his two sons who appeared to be going fishing down by the nearby river. As the two of us got started along the trail, I looked back one last time before the trees enveloped my view of the parking lot. I saw the father and the kids unloading some fishing rods. When the father asked the kid who appeared to be his oldest or biggest son to grab the tackle box under the back seat, by then the trees around us had overtaken our view. It was now just us and nature and a slowly reddening sky. After about 15 minutes of a walk, we ended up setting camp in a small clearing, which set several yards to the right of the trail. If any other hikers happened to walk by and turn their head, they'd be able to see us pretty clearly. The two of us fumbled with getting the tent set up, eventually laughing each time we failed to do so. When we managed to rig it in a way that it wouldn't fall, we collapsed in the ground, tired, and getting pretty hungry. Craig whipped out two astronaut ice cream sandwiches from his backpack, tossing one at me. It was a Neapolitan flavor, you know, strawberry, vanilla, then chocolate. It was dry as heck, as expected, but really delicious. I see some kindling back there not too far behind you. Would you grab it? We'll get a fire going. Craig requested. I nodded and did as he asked. I brought back a mess of twigs. We made a slight hole in the ground and put the twigs inside. He poured some lighter fluid on it and set it ablaze. Then slowly, one by one, he piled on some small logs until there was a full-blown fire before us. He began to pull out two of those collapsing camping chairs. We'd brought those along too, though I think he was regretting it. Carrying just one of those heavy and awkwardly sized things was a bit much, especially for a long hiking trip. But at least we'd have something to sit down on that wasn't dirty or wooden. He passed me the light blue, and he sat down in a lime green. With a big sigh, he asked me, How are you holding up so far? I swatted at a gnat or mosquito or something on my neck, then answered, I love being out here, but, uh... Never really went camping much. Well, you probably can't tell, Craig said, smacking his beer belly, then laughing. But I'm no outdoorsman either. So, uh, what you hungry for? Beef stew or chicken soup? He pulled out a couple of MRE bags, then dangled them in front of me to let me choose. Uh, your choice, I answered, not really knowing what to say. I'd never really had an MRE before, and I wasn't too sure they'd be very good. Beef stew it is. He placed the other bag back in the backpack, then carefully began to read the immense instructions on the back of that bag. After watching him for way too long trying to figure it out, he finally managed to get the bag to the point where the food was heating up inside. We had to sit a couple more minutes before it was done. There was an awkward silence for a while. I think Craig was trying to figure out what to say to me. And to be fair, I didn't know what to say to him either. Suddenly, he blurted out, So, uh, how, how's school been? Got a particular girl in your life? I smirked. I don't know why, but him asking me that, it made me feel irritated. Sure, hiking along the way here and chatting it up and cooperating has been fine for me. But I think it was because those activities weren't exclusive to a father and son. But when he asked me about school, 
It reminded me of how my dad would ask how school was after I'd come home, and I didn't like that. This may sound immature and even mean, but it made me feel like he was pretending to be my dad, but he wasn't. In my head, he was not my dad. He was just a strange man who met my mom, and they happened to get along together. I felt forced to know him, and now I felt forced to bond with him. Looking back on this now, I feel so bad. But back then, my head was filled with anger, rebellion, and the only thing I could think to say was, that's not your business, Craig. Oh, uh, no, I, I'm sorry, I, I understand, but... Craig apologized swiftly, his sincerity stumbling out as words I couldn't piece together. Eventually, he caught up with himself and breathed in real deep. What I meant to say was, I know, maybe that was a personal question. I just, well, I want to be your friend first. I know I'll never be your dad. I know that, but I do want to be your friend. Is that okay? I suddenly felt guilt for reacting the way I did, but that was soon replaced with feeling embarrassment for myself. I felt stupid. And I felt awkward. I wasn't ready for the sudden heart-to-heart. -heart. Uh, I'm just gonna... I began to stand up. When suddenly, something landed right in front of us, landing right on the fire and putting it out all at once. I fell back into my chair, and Craig shouted. The two of us looked down at the campfire together, and there we saw the strangest thing... There was no trace of the dark object we saw briefly fall between us. There was no trace of an impact on the fire either. Instead, the fire was out. Well, it wasn't out, actually. It was, it was as if it had never been started. The hole was there that we dug for the fire, and my kindling was waiting to be lit. There was no trace of the twigs being burned. As a matter of fact... The small logs that Craig had placed in the fire were now gone. What in the world, he said, then turned around where he'd kept the logs. Oh my god, he muttered. What? C Craig, what is it? I was feeling a bit nervous then. Without turning around, he instead beckoned me with his hand. I came over and looked over his shoulder. There on the ground was each and every log he had found and gathered, including the ones he had placed in the fire. They'd somehow returned to their spot behind them and were not charred or burnt at all. Ah, uh, how is that possible? I asked. You're asking me? I've got no idea, he admitted. It's like a glitch in the matrix, I guess. I think he was trying to make light of the situation. It wasn't really scary. It was just really confusing, because neither of us had any idea what had just happened. Soon after that, we prepared the tent and got ready to go to sleep. As we got cozy in our sleeping bags, just when things were supposed to get quiet, we instead heard a noise in the distance, sounding like it was coming from above us like it was coming from the sky. The noise was like a metallic hum. It was one note, playing slowly for the next hour. We sat there listening to it, wondering what it could be from. I guessed it was a plane or something, but there weren't any airports or bases near us. If it was a plane flying overhead, it would have been long gone in a couple of minutes. Craig made a joke about it being just a really weird bird. I didn't know how to reply. He eventually fell asleep, and after several more minutes of confusion, I was too tired to keep my eyes open. In the morning, we packed up, heading further up the trail. The plan was to make it to the peak and then go back down, camping another night before going home. But plans be damned, we never did make it to the peak. Three quarters of the way up, the humming sound we'd heard in the sky the previous night came again. This time, it was ahead of us, 
not above us at all, but ahead of us. Like, if we kept walking, we'd run into it, whatever it was. With curiosity, we kept going, albeit more slowly than before. At the next bend in the trail, I stepped around the corner first and stopped. It took everything I had just to keep breathing. Oh my god, I said, and Craig came rushing up to me, asking what was going on, but then he was breathless too the next second. Ahead of us, where the canopy and the trees opened up just above the trail, hovered three vortexes. They're hard to describe. They were these black voids sort of spiraling and swirling in on themselves. Each of them hovered a few feet off the ground. I was so awestruck and dying for an explanation for these things that it took me a minute or two to notice the dead deer on the ground. It was a buck. It seemed to have been freshly killed by something. Its midsection was all torn up. They began to descend, these vortexes, onto the carcass. Must have taken them a couple more minutes to do so. They descended so slowly. All the while, Craig and I were dead silent. When these black spinning things made contact with the deer's body, a great wind began to well out from it pushing us back. We struggled to keep our footing, and we looked on, trying to see what was going to happen. The three black objects suddenly formed together and disappeared instantly. There was no flash of light, no sudden blackout, nothing like that. They were just gone. Maybe we just couldn't comprehend how they left. But looking back on the trail... The deer's carcass was gone. There were no signs of a struggle in the dirt, no markings at all that the things could have left, no sign of a great wind. Craig, in utter disbelief, ran over to where the deer had been laying before. He was pawing at the ground, muttering, It doesn't make sense. How is that possible? Before looking back at me. I, I don't think it's safe here, he confessed. Suddenly, there was a deep snort or huff to the left of us. I ran over to Craig, a bit scared, and stood next to him. We both faced the woods and saw a buck standing there, perfectly healthy. The horns and that color of fur, they looked the same. The same as the deer that had just been lying on the ground. Its ears twitched at the sound of a twig snapping nearby. Before I could see what it was coming from, Craig had grabbed me by the arm and told me to run. I kept looking back, though, as we did so. The deer had begun to run as well, but a large cat, a mountain lion, I think, had fallen down onto it and was now tearing into its midsection. Tearing into it at the exact same spot we'd found its carcass before. We were running down the trail now, we need to go home. I don't think it's right here. I I'm really, really sorry. I was having fun. He looked at me, out of breath. And as if asking permission, he said, maybe we can do something else sometime soon. Would that be okay? I swallowed hard, and I nodded. We started to slow down. We were exhausted now, and it was almost dark again. I'm not sure where we are, Craig said. I've got no idea how close we are to the bottom. I sighed. I don't either. And I really don't want to get lost. Maybe we should set up camp again. We could keep going in the morning. Craig thought it over for several seconds. I may have suggested it, but I had no idea if it was the right decision. We didn't know what the black things were, or if they were even alive didn't know if they were dangerous. We just felt weird about the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, you're right. We'll stay, we'll stay another night, and in the morning, we'll find our way back down. We set up the tent again. We were much more efficient this time. We got some firewood and had a fire going pretty quick. This time the fire was much bigger. Guess we both had a newfound fear of the dark out here. 
We didn't say anything to each other the rest of the night, and when we went to bed in the tent, we made sure not to put the fire out this time. We just had to have a nightlight. Before we went to sleep, though, there was one thing said. From his sleeping bag, Craig said to me, Good night. I'll make sure to get you home safe tomorrow, I promise. Once again, that feeling of being told something that my dad should be telling me came over me. A bit of anger bubbled to the top, and I couldn't help but reply, I'm not your responsibility, you know. You don't even have to be here. Craig didn't say anything after that, but I could feel that he wanted to. He just didn't know what to say. And just as before, I immediately felt guilt and embarrassment. Until I fell asleep, I kept repeating in my head, I shouldn't have said that. I woke up in the middle of the night, and as soon as I heard what had woke me up, my eyes grew wide. It was the humming sound again. It was close, but quiet. I sat straight up and reached over to wake up Craig, but his sleeping bag was empty. When I turned to face the entrance to the tent, the flap was open. I slowly poked out my head and I looked around. Didn't take me long to see that Craig was standing just beyond the campfire. He seemed to be staring at something, and when I felt a powerful gust of wind around me, I got out of the tent and I called out towards Craig. Are you all right? I asked. He didn't reply or move. I ran up to him and grabbed him by the shoulder, but he didn't budge. And then I saw what was before him. A large, black vortex, another one, but bigger than any we'd seen yet. And Craig had reached out his hand to touch it. Just before it made contact, I tried to blurt out to tell him to stop. I was even a second away from yanking on his shoulder to separate him from the thing, but it was too late. He touched it. The vortex disappeared, and Craig was gone. One moment, I felt his warm shoulder under my palm, and the next moment, I was latching on to nothing but the night air. Tears welled in my eyes, and then I remembered before. When this happened at the campfire, the logs had just appeared where they were, and when it happened to the deer, the deer had reappeared where it had been. I ran around the campsite, but Craig was not there. I ran up and down the trail for 20 yards or so, but Craig was nowhere to be seen. I went back to the campsite and crawled into the tent just to check and there he was. Craig was in his sleeping bag, but his eyes were wide open, and they were looking straight up. Craig, are you okay? Craig didn't even blink. From the movement of his sleeping bag, his chest rising and falling underneath, I knew he was alive, but he wasn't responsive. I waved my hand in front of his eyes, trying to get him to flinch, to blink, to respond in some way, but he wouldn't budge. Worried and morbidly curious, I crawled up right next to him, looked him in the eye, and slowly lowered my finger. I must have been only a millimeter away from touching his eyelid when I pulled my finger back. He wasn't going to respond to me. It was like he was catatonic. I was crying full on now tears dripping on to Craig's sleeping bag. I kept calling out to him, even shook him, but nothing would happen. What had he done? Why did he touch that thing? And the last thing I said to him, uh, I told him he didn't have to be here. Guilt had risen up in me more than ever before. I packed up everything, then searched Craig's bag for a cell phone. He hadn't brought one, because he didn't want any distractions from spending time with me. And I didn't have one because I'd simply forgotten to bring it. Great. When all that was left to pack up was the tent and Craig's sleeping bag, which I obviously wasn't able to, 
I tried to pick him up, but he was bigger than me. I tried to drag him, but that wasn't going to work. I hated the idea of it, but I knew that if I was going to get help, I'd have to leave him here. I tossed more logs in the fire, making sure that he would have plenty of light and warmth. I zipped up his tent real well, so that nothing could get inside. Before I walked down the trail, leaving him in the small clearing, I looked back. Then I whispered, I'm sorry. I took off running down that mountain, but the trail seemed longer than it had before. I ran and ran, tumbling a few times at the weight of my backpack. Soon, it was sunrise, letting me know that I'd been running for literally hours, even though the trip up to the highest point, where we'd found the deer, had taken no less than three or four hours of hiking. How could I have run several hours straight downhill and not be at the bottom? There was something truly wrong with this place, and I was soon struggling with the idea that I might not ever make it back. Soon the sun was high in the sky, and I was still running. I had no idea where I was getting the energy. I must have been crying the entire night. My eyes and my cheeks were sore, where tears had fallen and dried up. My face felt like a swollen mess. Just when I thought I was going to give up, I landed on a straightened and familiar part of the trail. I looked up, straight ahead, where I would have expected the trail to end. But what I saw was different. There was darkness. A wall of sheer black. A black that seemed to swirl in on itself. A black that gave off a strong wind. I looked left and right. This black wall seemed to extend for as far as I could see between the trees. I walked close to it. I followed it to the left for several meters. Still all darkness. I came back to the trail I was on, then went right. And again, nothing but black wall, like the blackness itself was shielding me from exiting the mountain. I came back to the trail, and I looked at it. There was only one way we were going to get off this mountain. I had to make it through. I took in a deep breath, and I swallowed down hard. I grabbed onto my backpack straps, as if they were lifelines. I closed my eyes, and I began to approach the black wall. My breathing became frantic, and my footsteps became less sure, but I kept going. One step. The already strong wind got even more rough, as if it was trying to pry open my eyelids, but I kept them closed. Two steps. The wind was so strong against my face, it felt as if it was pushing me back, and it was making it hard to breathe. Three steps. The wind died down immediately. The humming noise that had surrounded me had just stopped. When I opened my eyes, it was a couple of hours away from sunset, and there in front of me was the parking lot. Craig's truck was there. And to my left, a father and two sons, one of whom was excitedly racing to the back seat of the truck, pulling out a tackle box from underneath the seat. I was dumbfounded, and I turned around, expecting to see a black wall at the tree line. But what I was actually met with brought more tears to my eyes. I smiled. Whoa, you okay? If you don't want to go hiking, we don't have to. I mean, it was Craig. Happy and healthy and ready to begin our hike. It was like nothing ever happened. Not wasting another moment, I went with what he said. Craig, I'm feeling really sick. I think we need to go home. He hadn't realized I would take him up on his offer, so he started to ask if I was sure. He frowned, obviously disappointed. Are you sure? Maybe we can wait it out and you'll feel better. Shoving my tongue in the back of my throat and forcing myself to think about everything that had happened, I was able to make myself vomit. Okay, let's get back in the truck. We'll just go hiking another time. 
He helped me back to the truck. I sat in the passenger seat. Then he got in the driver's seat. His look of disappointment was worse now. I wiped my mouth and caught my breath. When I settled down, I looked at him and touched his shoulder. The same shoulder I'd latched onto when he disappeared. I told him, I I'm not trying to get out of it, I promise. How's about we do something else this weekend? I think it'd be a lot of fun. Just the two of us. He looked at me and smiled. He seemed relieved. Yeah, that sounds like a lot of fun. Encounter at Laxey Wheel, from Laserbrand. I'm a New Yorker, but from 1999 until 2001, I lived in the northern UK for school. I attended Manchester University. At the time, I was dating an Irish girl, and she and I decided to go on a trip to the Isle of Man, since the ferry was cheap and we were students with little expendable income. We ordered our tickets and packed our backpacks. We got on the ferry and ended up sparking a conversation with a couple, who I won't name, but their family owned a castle that they opened to the public, and they offered us room and board for next to nothing, as it was off-season tourist-wise, and we were poor students who were ecstatic and took the offer. Once on the aisle, we were warmly taken care of. One night after dinner with said couple, not sure why, but we started talking about the rich history of the Isle of Man, and its unique government. Everything from the TT motorcycle race to world record landmarks. They ended up mentioning the Laxey Will, the world's largest water will, and how it's just a short hike from the town of Laxey. We set off the next day and got to Laxey and got a room there. The next morning we were up very early at about 4 a.m. and we set off on our hike to Laxey Will. It was still dark then, our only light being streetlights. Our little tourist map had the hiking trail to the wheel on it. By the time we were up out of town going towards the wheel, the sun was just starting to come up again, and the air was very cool, and everything was getting dewy. There was a paved trail going up to the hill with little unpaved trails going away from it, with grass growing all around. We then found the wheel. It was massive, just huge. We sat down by it and ate some bread and smoked cod. I was sitting to the left of my then-girlfriend. I began to hear music faintly in the air, not coming from the town. I looked around wondering where it was coming from, but then just sort of dismissed it. But it grew louder, and I asked my girlfriend if she could hear it. She nodded, but could not pinpoint the direction. Thinking we weren't alone, we stood up and began to look around, thinking that some other hikers were coming. But no one showed up. I finally could tell where the music was coming from, though, and I began to walk towards it. I walked up the trail about a hundred feet away from the wheel. The music got louder and began sounding really good to me. At this point, I don't recall where my girlfriend was. I continued back and forth on a particular spot on the trail and realized the music was off the trail, seemingly in the grassy hilly meadow ahead of me. 
I walked off to go closer to it. The music was so alluring, amazing, like every favorite song you'd ever heard wrapped into one. I can't for the life of me label it in any genre. It was in the air and just intoxicating. I pushed forward until I saw a small round clearing in the grass, half expecting maybe a couple of youngsters doing the, you know, with the radio playing. So I slowed down and peeked over into this round clear area cautiously. What I saw, you won't believe. There were no young lovers, but tiny people dancing around and playing, singing to music. I literally rubbed my eyes. Was I hallucinating? But no, there they were, real as day, little blonde and brown-haired people. They had long hair, some braided, some not, and I had trouble discerning the males from females. They were dressed in what I could only call renaissance outfits. Some had hats on, and there were about 30 of them altogether. They were dancing roughly in a circle with a blonde woman standing in the middle, not dancing, just standing there being tended to by what appeared to be servants. Besides being very small, about 8 to 10 inches tall, she was very beautiful. She had a teal blue dress on and long blonde hair down past her waist. It was braided on her head, like a French braid, then it combined into one braid with tassels at the end. I stood there, watching at least 15 minutes when she looked up at me and linked her eyes with mine. Linked is the word, completely locked. I couldn't look away. She began to walk towards me, and when she did, all the other little people stopped and stared. As she walked, maybe 40 feet away from me, she seemed to grow taller. By the time she was at the edge of the small circle, she was my height. I'm six foot one. I looked behind her and the little people were still little, but just standing motionless. She briefly turned to her what I call servants and they fell back. She looked down at the edge of the circle with a sort of cautious look, then stepped into the grass. She walked right up to me and began to speak. She had wide set eyes that were large and light blue. She had a wide, flat forehead and a long, pointed nose. Her lips were thin, but still full in a way, if that makes sense. She's what I would call a handsome woman, a classic beauty, but more of a caricature. She smelled like a mixture of fresh, cool air and lilac blossoms. Not perfumed, more like it was her natural scent. It, too, was intoxicating. She began to talk to me, but I could not understand what she was saying. It sounded Scandinavian. That's the only man-made language I can think of that reminded me of this. I could tell she was asking me questions, but I could not understand what. She gestured behind me, as if to ask, did I come from that direction? I said I was sorry to intrude and that I came from the water wheel. She mimicked what I said, but in a questioning tone. My heart was in awe and started to flutter, like when I was a teen talking to a pretty girl. She held out her left hand and I reached out to touch it. Her fingers were beautiful and particularly long, like a good third longer than they should have been. I held out my right hand and held hers. It was warm and soft and quite strongly gripping. She didn't try to pull me, but when I relaxed my hand, she held mine more firmly. She stepped closer so we were face to face. I could feel her breathing on me as she spoke. She was 100% a living thing, even though I still had my doubts. I lifted my left hand towards her face and she moved her head back, but kept holding my hand. I closed my hand to withdraw it, but she grabbed it and held it to her face. She rested her face in it. She opened her eyes and moved forward to kiss me. That's when I heard my girlfriend absolutely screaming at me. I snapped out of it and looked behind me. My girlfriend was up on the path yelling at me, full bore with her hands to her sides. 
I turned back and the lady, or whatever she was, was gone, but I could still feel the residual feeling on my hand from her face. The clearing was there, but all the little people were missing. The sky was dark like the sun was down again. I ran back to my girlfriend. She said she had looked for me all day, and when she found me, I was just standing there completely motionless, like I was about to kiss someone who wasn't there. She said she was afraid to leave the trail because of stories she had heard when she was growing up in Ireland. Stories about the Fae folk. I'd been standing there so long that even people from town had begun looking for me. It was sundown, but for me, it had been early morning when I last spoke with my girlfriend. To this day, I have not lived a single minute without thinking of that woman. My heart physically aches and yearns for her. I honestly don't know what she was, but she couldn't have been human. Something in the Mountains from Pei West I live with my family and our house is on the edge of the city near the mountains. In my region, there are lots of suitable places to hike. Some may be a bit dangerous, but nonetheless worth the time to go hiking with friends and staying overnight. My house is in a small neighborhood, and just behind our backyard is a pathway that goes up the hills and into the mountains, not too far away from the house. You get the picture. One day I was working on a project that I had to take to university. It was due the next day. My parents called me downstairs and told me that they were taking my little brother and were going to a family gathering. So I said goodbye and ran back upstairs to continue with my project. After a couple of hours, the project was finally done. I looked at the clock and it read 5.45 p.m. and the sun was still out. So I decided to go for a quick hike to calm my mind. I got ready, took some gear, and went on the path behind the house. I headed into the mountains. On my way, I saw many wild animals like birds, deer, and squirrels. I even cautiously stumbled upon a bear with some newborns. The only unnatural thing there was was a three-story building which was abandoned long ago but I'd seen it many times before. It wasn't so unusual for me. The nature was amazing, as always, with the wildlife and calming sounds around me. My adventure couldn't have been better. After some time, I got to a cliff which was one of my favorite places to visit, as it overlooked the neighborhood and the fields beyond it. It also provided the perfect, beautiful view for the sunset. I sat there for a while listening to the music of nature around me, enjoying the cold breeze that was coming down over the mountains. I saw the sunset, took a few pictures, and packed up to head back home. While I was doing so, I noticed something change. The sounds around me went soft, softer, until they were gone. I didn't give it too much thought as it was a steady change and I only barely noticed it. I was soon on my way. The day was slowly turning into night and I still could not hear any wildlife around me. On my way, I had to bring out my flashlight because now it was completely dark. I looked at my watch and it was now 8.20 p.m. I went down the mountain and passed the abandoned building. As I was walking down the path, I heard a loud and chilling shriek that was like a woman's scream, but the sound wasn't right. It was deformed, you could say. I looked behind me to where the sound had come from. No way, I thought. It sounded like it was coming from the building, and instead of thinking of what dangers could await me, I immediately thought that someone was in trouble. After a bit of hesitation, I took out my pocket knife and started to approach the building. When I was about 10 meters from the building, the loud shriek came again, but much louder than before. I began doubting my decision of going inside, but there was no way I was leaving that person in here. 
I flashed my light into the building and saw the stairway at the end of the hall. I slowly went inside, making sure not to make a single sound, because I didn't want to give away my position. I realized that the flashlight could blow my cover, so I turned it off and I put it back in my pocket. There was some very dim moonlight illuminating the hallway, so I could make out where I was going. When I got to the second floor where there were four rooms, and after checking all of them, I found that they were empty. The sound must have come from the third floor. As I was making my way up to the stairs, I heard a loud thud followed by another shriek. When I was closer, I was certain that whatever was making that sound wasn't a person. It couldn't have been. Then, for some reason, curiosity maybe, I made the decision that I will regret for the rest of my life. I decided to investigate the weird noise and went looking for it. I went upstairs and began my search. The first room was empty, then I noticed that the door of the third was half open. I went closer and slowly opened it. The light of the moon came in from the broken window, illuminating a small part of the room, but it was mostly dark. As my eyes were scanning the room, trying to find whatever was the source of the noise, I heard it again, like someone laughing with their mouth closed. <laughs> this sent chills down my spine. And then, I finally saw it. There in the corner of the room, two yellow eyes, nearly seven feet off the ground, and they were pointed right at me. My mind stopped. I couldn't think at all. I couldn't even react. Then the creature spoke. Its voice was deep, and it rumbled my stomach as it echoed throughout the building. It said, You shouldn't have come here. The shock from hearing it talk forced me out of my paralysis. With my mind returned to me, I immediately began to run. As I got to the stairs, I turned back to look at the room and my soul almost left my body. Because there, in the door, I saw the thing peering its head into the hallway looking at me. That was it for me. I ran like never before in my life. I made it back downstairs in just a couple of seconds and ran out of the building into the moonlight. As I was running down the path, I heard the shriek one last time. I stopped for a second and looked back at the building. There in the broken window on the third floor were those yellow eyes piercing into my soul. I started running again, never stopping until I got back home. My parents were home and became concerned about my situation. I didn't tell them what happened. I told them instead that I was chased by a bear. Fortunately, it's been four months since we moved from that house, and I hope whoever moves into it stays far away from that abandoned building. The Dark Entity from Anonymous My friends and I went to Sagada, located in the mountain province of Philippines. We arrived at 10 in the morning and checked in at the lodge, which we had booked prior to the trip. We rested for a while and had some lunch. Then we decided to go spelunking at Sumagwing and Lumiang Caves. In the evening, while having dinner, we got acquainted with someone who asked us to come with her and watch the sunrise at Kiltapon Peak. It was a two-hour hike, so we agreed to meet up with her around four in the morning. After having a few drinks at a local pub, we went back to the lodge. I looked at my watch and found that it was already 11 in the evening. My friends are already asleep on a separate bed, and all the lights are off except the one coming from the balcony. For some unknown reason, though I was exhausted at the time, I felt restless. As a habit, I would grab my iPad and start checking Facebook, scrolling down until I got sleepy and dozed off. It wasn't long when my sleep was interrupted by movement in my room. I thought it was one of my friends already awake and preparing for the hike. I found it weird, 
because earlier that day he had set up his phone as an alarm, but I hadn't heard the sound. I would usually lie on my stomach when I sleep. I guess I was too tired that time, so I didn't bother to turn around and have a look. Suddenly, I felt a hand touch my back, and I thought it was him trying to wake me up. Odd, I felt as though the hand seemed bigger than his, and the fingers were strangely long. I turned around and was extremely horrified. This wasn't my friend, but a very dark, smoke-like figure with pointed ears and red, fiery eyes. I let out a loud scream. It woke my friends up, and immediately all the lights turned on as they panicked. I looked around and noticed that it was already gone. Everyone was looking at me, worried. I told them what happened, but they thought I had a nightmare. I told them that I hadn't slept, but they continued to claim that it was a dream. But I know it was real. After that, we never went back to sleep. We had our coffee and headed downstairs to meet up with our new friend and to begin the hike up to the mountain. There were only four of us, yet I felt another presence among us. During the hike, we passed by a lamppost, and that's when I noticed that everyone else had a single shadow, but mine had another to it. Another figure being cast by a light source that just wasn't there. It was then that I realized that the thing from the night before might be following me. I didn't want to worry everyone else, so I kept my distance from the group, and I stayed quiet. Even though we were being guided by a map, we got lost nearly the entire day, taking several routes that only got us more lost. We ran into a number of dead ends that didn't even appear on the map. We even went beyond the trail. We somehow managed to reach our destination, though, and when we did, I finally felt better. But on our way back, our new friend asked why I looked so distressed the whole time. But I said I was just tired. When in town, I asked around from the locals. I was shocked to find out that they had lore about this very occurrence, stating that many folks who go into or around those caves end up having something attached to them as the land around those caves is a burial ground. That was something I was never told, otherwise I wouldn't have gone in the first place. After I got back home, the attachment seemed to have left me, and I couldn't have been more thankful. I'll never trespass on burial grounds again, and if I'm not sure about the land around me, it's better to be safe than sorry. Stalked by Something From Luke I'm 17 years old and don't really believe in the paranormal. Now, me and my friend Dylan, who's also 17, often go on hikes late at night every few days a week. During this time, we never experience anything out of the ordinary. But that would change. On one of these hikes one night... I suggested we do something a little bit more exciting and maybe a bit silly. I thought it'd be fun to play with a Ouija board in the middle of the night in the middle of the woods. He agreed with a broad grin, telling me it was a ridiculous idea, but he was all in for it. We had a tight budget, so we had to print the Ouija board ourselves and use a glass as a substitute for a planchette. The following night, approximately at 10 p.m., we headed out. I had a rucksack with the Ouija quote-unquote board in it, some newspaper to sit on, and a bit of food. We hiked to the nearest forest, where I knew the location of a ruined monastery. It was already pitch black, and it took a while for our eyes to adjust to the darkness. After 20 minutes of walking and telling each other how dumb this was, we arrived at the monastery, where I turned on the torch on my phone to find a suitable place to play the game. I unpacked the board and the newspaper, while Dylan got the glass from his jacket pocket 
which was far too big, so we had to resort to using a coin. I began to ask the board standard questions, to which there was no response, as we expected. After ten minutes of messing around with it, we heard some dogs barking in the distance. That alone was a bit creepy. Let me remind you, we were in the middle of the forest, and it was pitch black. Some other kind of animal began to shriek. We thought it was a bird, but it was unlike anything we'd heard before. Suddenly, a cat ran straight past us. We stood up, shocked, and glanced around, half expecting something else to show itself. As quickly as the sound started, they stopped, and it went completely quiet. At this point, we were on edge. Dylan broke the silence by asking if we should try to use the board again. I sat back down while nodding slowly. By then, we weren't even really concentrating on the game, but instead just scanning the tree line and glancing around. I've heard stories like this before, and never understood how people could say they felt watched. But that changed right then. Dylan stood up, not wanting to play the game anymore. As I looked at his face, I saw an expression I'd never seen on it before. One of fear. Pure fear. I began packing the bag when we heard heavy footsteps from behind the trees. We just stood there in terror, trying to be as silent as possible. Whatever it was, it was definitely no bear, because we don't have those in Switzerland. Not even wolves. But being able to tell from the sound of these steps... This was definitely nothing small. And then, out of nowhere, the smell of rotting meat hit us like a freight train. I've no idea where the smell originated, but it was gut-wrenching, and I could feel bile rising up from my stomach immediately. Without saying a word, Dylan and I bolted down the path that would lead us back. While we ran down the hill, there was something behind us, chasing after us, something bigger and heavier than both of us. We didn't dare look back. As we crossed a river, there was a splashing sound coming from right behind us. It probably tried taking a shortcut by bypassing the bridge. I quickly took a glance back, but I could see nothing but darkness. As we passed the first few street lamps, the footsteps stopped but that didn't keep us from running another three minutes. I lit a cigarette, shaking my head in disbelief as Dylan was losing his mind, asking me what the hell that was. But I had no clue, and to this day, I still don't. Hiking Strangeness from Spooky Panda Boy I was born and raised in South Carolina. I've always lived in rural places, so I've never been scared of the wilderness before. But still, I can see how they can be creepy, which is something I actually like. When I was eight years old, we moved out of my childhood home to live with my grandparents. They had a house built in a nice neighborhood in the middle of the woods. Me and my sisters loved living there, and we explored the woods often. One day, my sister Carly went somewhere with our mom, and our dad was at work. Me and my other sister Katie probably should have stayed inside then, but that would have been boring. We went into the woods and explored areas we hadn't yet discovered. About an hour into our hike, we started up a steep hill when we found something. It was a large, spinal disc. This didn't scare us at first. There was a nearby farm with cattle there, and it wasn't uncommon for them to get out. So if one wandered out here, it could have gotten lost or even attacked by animals, so the bone wasn't too strange. But not too far nearby, we found something else. The strangest looking footprint I'd ever seen. It was shaped like a chicken's foot, but it was massive, far bigger than both of my feet combined. At this point, we were unsettled, but we kept walking anyway, sure that nothing bad could happen. 
After a few minutes, we heard the loud and unsettling cry of a very large animal, almost bird-like. I was beginning to cry, especially after everything we'd seen. We immediately started running home, but the shrieking got louder. We didn't tell our parents what happened or what we found, because we went outside when we weren't supposed to, and I thought we'd get in trouble. If I told my mom, I knew she wouldn't let us hike anymore. This was the type of thing that would deter most people from ever exploring again, but not me. As I got older, I just got more obsessed and curious. It's been several years since then, and I'm hoping to have even more odd encounters. I'd be happy to, as long as I can remain alive. What We Encountered in Those Woods Submitted by Chris B. I lived in Tennessee, and I was a big fan of camping and hiking. In 2006, me, my girlfriend, and my cousin, with four other friends, had gone out on a hiking trip. My girlfriend's uncle had a rather large property he sometimes allowed people to stay at. In one remote corner of this land, he even had an old cabin that he would rent out occasionally, and this property was connected to a no man's land, as some people called it. You could go out there, as some of us had before, but you wouldn't see any other signs of people at all. We intended to rough it along the back trails with the intention to camp overnight. After a long hike, it got dark, so we built a fire and set up our small tents. Then we had a couple of beers, cooked a few hot dogs over the flames. It was pleasantly uneventful until near midnight. We had been telling stories when suddenly, my cousin started looking off into the dark and began to try to hush us. Shh, guys. After a few moments of quiet, I tried to ask what was happening when he bluntly told me to hush up. I heard something like voices out there, I think. We all stayed quiet for the next minute or two, my cousin swearing he had heard voices, voices calling out there past the tree line in the distance. Soon we began catching what sounded like the faintest yelling that we couldn't quite make out and the few of us began yelling back to whoever it was out there in the dark, trying to get a response of any kind. We thought that maybe someone was lost. In these woods, it wouldn't be hard. Hello, is someone out there? Are you okay? My girlfriend yelled, joined in by one of my friends, shouting through his cupped hands. Hello! All we heard in reply, was what sounded like muffled voices, two voices, as if they were calling from a great distance. But it sounded like there was somebody moving around just on the far side of the nearby tree line, and they couldn't have been greater than 100 yards away. More echoing shouts came from that area, but they were still indiscernible. It sounded like two people shouting at the same time, Increasingly, I became nervous, wondering who was moving around out there, imagining backwoods creeps playing games with their victims. Here at midnight, something was wrong, I felt. For a short while, we heard nothing. One of my friends went to his gear and retrieved the old Ruger Bearcat 22 that his father gave him as a gift. If someone wants to rush our camp, I'd like for us to be ready, he said. I nodded, feeling on edge. Do you need help? My cousin shouted again. In response came two voices shouting vaguely once more, still sounding distant. Before, they had sounded like someone shouting words, even if we couldn't quite make it out. But now, the shouts were loud and garbled, wordless shouts and baying noises. Someone was moving around out there, my girlfriend said what I was thinking quietly. Who are these people? Why are they here and why are they messing around somebody's camp right now? For the next half hour, there was silence besides the fire and the nightlife. 
we sat on guard around the fire, straining to listen. During that stretch, we heard no more shouting or footfalls. We resolved to keep the 22 around, just in case someone came barging into our camp. Several minutes later, we heard what sounded like people moving about only a short distance past the light cast by our fire. Footfalls and the crackle of branches and leaves. It sounded like someone was staggering around at a brisk speed just out of our campsite. A couple of us expected someone to step into the light at any moment, but no one did. Suddenly, it stopped. Not another voice was heard, no footfalls, no crunching of grass or branches, nothing to indicate that the people or things that were by our camp were still there, or had even gone away for that matter. It was more like they had just started standing still. All of us were extremely nervous, especially with how the sounds of footsteps had just stopped instead of moving away. We were sure somebody was just watching us from a ways off and waiting for us to fall asleep. We managed to organize ourselves to sleep in shifts, at least two people to stay awake at all times while the others slept in our tents. It wasn't easy, especially with an odd-numbered group, but the rest of the night passed without incident, thankfully. In the morning, we nervously gathered our gear and decided to leave the appeal of being out in the woods having vanished in the night. What disturbed me was how far off the voices had sounded, yet how closely the movements had come to us, and how they had disappeared so suddenly. I was certain that this was not just some people deciding to prank campers, or any sneaking backwoodsmen having a good laugh. This was something else entirely. Number two, M, submitted by Mr. Snores. It happened about two years ago. My friends, Pete and Joe, were spending the week at my house. It was summer vacation after all. We lived in a small town to the west of Tennessee. There were plenty of fields around where I lived, so we usually went out on hikes. It was getting late one evening, we had just finished watching some scary movies and were having trouble sleeping, of course. That's when Joe had the bright idea of going to a nearby field for a bit of a midnight hike. I told him we weren't allowed to go hiking at night, but he didn't care. Pete wasn't so sure at first, but after he was convinced, the two of them convinced me, and sure enough, we started to sneak out. Luckily, my parents were fast asleep so that part was easy. Now, we had never been in this field at night. We were aware of coyotes and such, so I had brought my machete just in case. As soon as we entered the field, we immediately got the feeling that we were being watched. We tried to ignore it, because to me, it was probably the fact that we were out where we shouldn't be, when we shouldn't be. Around 20 minutes later, we decided to stop for a break. Pete and Joe decided to sit down for a little bit, but I couldn't. I got that same feeling again, as if we were being watched or even worse, hunted. I decided to go over to a nearby hill so I could look out over the fields. It wasn't too dark due to the fact that it was a full moon and we were in a large open field. At the time, this field was growing wheat and the wheat grew to about my waist, so anything I spotted, it could easily slip away into the wheat grass, or not be shown at all because it hid underneath it. At first, to my relief, I didn't see anything, but after a few moments, I spotted movement, and then I saw them, these bright yellow eyes. They were about 100 yards away. I nearly jumped when I saw them, Remember what I said about the wheatgrass being to my waist? Well, I was about 5'7 at the time, and these eyes were easily four feet above the wheatgrass. Whatever it was, it was tall, taller than me, and I was so scared that I couldn't move. Shortly thereafter, P 
Pete and Joe came up to the hill to see what I was doing. One look at my face, and they knew something was wrong, horribly wrong. Joe asked me, dude, what's up? But I couldn't speak, barely breathe. All I could do was point at those awful yellow eyes. After a few seconds of looking, they both saw what I was staring at, and we all just stood there motionless, when all of a sudden, the eyes disappeared into the wheat grass, as if the creature was now crawling. Immediately, we turned and ran. We ran so fast, it all seemed like a blur. We didn't even know if this thing was coming towards us, but we were not waiting around to find out. When we finally got to the end of my road, we all stopped to catch our breaths, assuming we were safe, but we were wrong. That's when we heard the loudest, deepest, hair-raising howl I'd ever heard. Then we heard panting and loud footsteps, as if something the size of a bear was running towards us. Again, we turned and ran down the street until we were next to my house. Then we did something stupid. We looked back, and what we saw still haunts me to this day. It was terrifyingly close to us. I could see it perfectly. It had stopped under a street light about 50 yards away, but it was standing on two legs. It had a muscular torso like a person, but the legs were bent and shaped like a dog's legs. Its arms were long, as were its legs, and it had the head of a wolf or a bear. It was covered in black fur, and it stood there watching us. We couldn't take it anymore. We ran inside. We locked all the doors, the windows, but before we could feel safe again, there was one last window that we had to lock upstairs, but because of the positioning of the window, I was too scared to go up. That window had a perfect view of the creature, which meant it had a perfect view of me. Eventually, I built up the courage to go to the window. While I was locking it, I couldn't help but look down at the street, and there it was still, and just like I had feared, it was looking up at me. I locked it as quickly as I could and ran back to tell Joe and Pete. Then we all ran upstairs to watch it, but it was gone by the time I got back. We didn't sleep that night. The next day, we felt it was best to tell my parents the story, but the only part of the story they wanted to hear was the part where we snuck out at night. Pete and Joe went home and I was grounded. Anyone else we told wouldn't believe us, but I think we know what we saw and I will never go to that field at night again. Like I said, it's been two years, and I finally convinced myself to go back to the field for hikes during the day. But every now and then, I get that same feeling, like something is watching me. Number three, The Thing in DeBerry Swamp. Submitted by Alpha64. I'm 15 years old and live in a remote part of Florida. A couple of years ago, I was really into hiking and going into the woods with friends. To start this off, me and my friend Liam were out together hiking in the woods. We would always go on the weekends just to wind down and relax or to have some airsoft wars in the drier parts of the woods. After one long day of fishing, we were unpacking our gear as the sun was beginning to set. When Liam noticed something strange with the tackle box we had brought along with us, hey Blake, he said, dude, come check this out. I came over to him, a little annoyed as I was still setting up my tent and it was a pain in the butt to pitch. What is it? I stopped as I now saw the long scratch marks that were engraved in the top and side of the now mangled tackle box. What in the world did that? I asked, still examining the scratch marks. I couldn't seem to figure out what kind of animal had tried to get into his box. I don't know, he replied, but it was like this when we had come back to set up the tent. 
I was now a little on edge, thinking, great, there's probably a bear in the area. Keep your knife close by you when you sleep tonight, I said, clutching my pocket knife I had brought along. We made our fire and began talking. After a little while, the thoughts of earlier had drifted to the back of our minds until we both heard what sounded like footsteps of some sort of animal coming from the underbrush. We both looked over at the source of the noise, thinking about what it could be. Those footsteps were too loud to be anything like a raccoon or a squirrel, so we had our knives out just in case it was a predator stalking us. But what emerged from the underbrush has permanently scarred my mind. It was a tall, thin, and pale-looking creature, almost pathetic-looking in how scrawny it was, but its hands were claws that were bigger than any I'd seen attached to an animal. I don't think it even had eyes, only dark pits of where the eyes should have been, but I knew it was still somehow staring at us. It then made this ear-piercing shriek, lowered down on all fours, and began to charge at us. By then, I couldn't keep myself from shrieking this unmanly sound from my mouth, and I did the only thing I could think to do, and I kicked the tackle box at it in a quick attempt to distract or hurt it. As soon as the box hit the creature, Liam and I made a mad dash toward the bathroom building that was inside the nearby camping area. Once we made it, we locked ourselves inside, we didn't get an ounce of sleep that night, still hearing the wild pattering circling the building, and occasionally hearing the creatures shrieking and clawing at the outside walls of the little building we were in. I was afraid that it was going to come through the door at any moment. We had stopped hearing the shrieking at one point, and the pattering died down, but we still waited to go outside until the sun rose, just in case it was waiting for us. When we finally did emerge from our temporary safe haven, we saw claw marks all over the door and walls of the little building. We quickly made our way back to the camp, keeping out a close eye on our surroundings. When we made it back, everything was destroyed and thrown all over the place. We turned around and got out of there as quickly as possible, not picking up our stuff, not wanting that thing to come back to us. When we got back to Liam's place, we decided not to go back out there and to not tell anyone what we saw, because despite what we just lived through, the sound of the story made it seem insane. Number four, The Creepy Man, submitted by Clara. When I was 16 years old, I lived in Michigan. I am a huge athletic nerd and I go hiking every day, unless I feel lazy. On a particular day, I picked the wrong day to go because I met someone and experienced something I will not want to experience ever again. So one day I drove to my favorite hiking trail. It's the one I go to just about every time I go hiking. And right away, I saw this weird guy. He looked to be in his mid-30s, but me being as stubborn and hard-headed as I was, I ignored my gut instinct, which was telling me to just go home today. So I parked, got out, and went on the jogging trail. Before I disappeared on the trail, though, I got a short glance at the guy. He was looking back at me, too. So I looked away and went off. I got 200 to 300 yards away from the entrance, and I took a short break. And that's around the time I heard this scream. It sounded like it was from a man. I looked down the path to see if someone needed help, but my heart sank in my chest. It was the guy from the start of the trail. He was running straight toward me. My adrenaline pumped, and I began to run away from them as fast as possible. But he was catching up to me quickly, and I thought I was pretty fast. The guy ran like he had taken two shots of steroids or something. When I realized him catching up to me was inevitable, I began to cry and panic. 
I took a sharp turn straight into the woods, and I started to run back toward the parking lot area. But I never stopped hearing those footsteps not too far behind me. Soon, though, as I kept running, the footsteps behind me were growing faint. They were going slower than before, and I was getting closer and closer to the parking lot, to my escape. At last, I broke through the tree line, and I ran for my car. Once there, I locked the doors, I took out my cell phone, and I called the cops. Not so long after they arrived, they searched for the man and found him. Apparently, he was a 37-year-old homeless man, and better yet, he was carrying around a butcher knife in one of his coat pockets, something he had found behind a restaurant in a dumpster. So, what was he going to do with that, I wonder? To this day, I am still glad I did ROTC throughout high school, or else I'm sure he would have caught up to me, or I would have run out of energy faster. Creepy maniac homeless man, please stay away from me. And number five, my experience, submitted by Vincent. I tell this story not as a call for attention, but as a cautionary tale. I was 14 and in a scout troop. Our scout troop was relatively small. We were camping in an area adjacent to a large hill. It wasn't tall enough to be considered a mountain, but if you fell, you would probably break a few things. And it was super steep. This is necessary for the story. After we had pitched our tents, it was dark. It was only about 10 p.m., so we had some time to ourselves. We all decided to climb the hill together. We were scouts, so hiking was our thing. The hill was quite steep, though, so we had to bring a rope and tie it to the fence. After I made sure it wouldn't come undone, we began to ascend. We walked around and found a section of fence that appeared to have been trampled over. Behind that fence, there was an old circular concrete building. We began to walk around the thing, and we soon found an entrance. There was a small box with a ladder that went up maybe about 20 feet or so. We all climbed the ladder and found a small steel door that gained us roof access, and the roof was huge. Across the roof, there was a heavy steel trap door. We opened it and found at least a 25-foot drop. There was a ladder, however, so us being the brave scouts we thought we were, we began to climb in. The area inside was cavernous and massive, with concrete braces holding the ceiling up and a light blue tarp along the walls. It was incredibly dark down there, so visibility was extremely limited. Now, some people in my scout troop thought they were funny, so the two people standing guard on the roof closed the trap door. And I mean we were trapped, then, as if something inside with us could tell that we were stuck, we began to hear a certain click, click, clicking. We all thought it was ambient noises or rocks falling from somewhere, so we tried to ignore it and went on. But moments later, one of the scouts shouted, Who is that? He knew nobody was there. Mike, what's going on? Someone else asked him. I felt someone breathing on my neck. Mike was now shouting. Knives drawn, we got close together. Somewhere else, we heard a laugh. Not that of someone laughing at a joke, but a distant echo of a laughing, insane person. It echoed throughout the old building. Someone turned on their flashlight, and to our surprise, we saw a man. He appeared to be homeless. His face was old and worn, his hair untidy. He was only wearing an old, ripped and stained pair of jeans, and he looked as if he had not seen the sun in decades. He was an intimidating and deranged sight. 
The man himself only scared us a little bit. What really scared us was the knife he was holding. Keep in mind, we saw this man suddenly and over the course of a single second. Then he began screaming. Thank the heavens that the screaming they heard concerned the two people that were on the roof who had trapped us. They knew us, so they knew that we were not capable of such an ungodly noise. They opened the trap door and shouted, What was that? And with that, the man ran towards us. We all wildly ran toward the ladder and climbed up, with the first guy literally jumping on. I happened to be the one in the way back. I was climbing up the fifth rung when something grabbed a hold of my foot. Panicking, I swung down at him. What I didn't realize was that I was still holding my knife. It was thankfully closed, and I ended up merely bashing him across the skull with the grip. He screamed again and let go. Thankfully, this allowed us to fully escape. I climbed up the ladder, and as I resurfaced on the roof, I saw the man bleeding. He was now climbing the rusty ladder. Just then, the door closed, trapping him in there. Not wanting to take any chances, we ran back to the small door, taking us to the room with the ladder to the exit. Again, I was the last one there, and I blocked it off. I ended up tying the bar to one of the ladder's rungs, using an old bicycle tire that was nearby. I got onto the ladder myself, and I rushed down. I met back up with my fellow scouts over by the exit. We all silently decided to never speak of this moment. We'd probably get in a lot of trouble anyway. We got over to the trampled fence, and we made our way back down. We didn't go back up that hill again. To make sure nobody else got any bright ideas, I untied the rope, and I slid down the hill. The rest of the week was uneventful, but on the last night, I could have sworn I heard a distant screaming. Not that of a man in pain, but that of a man who had been driven into madness. Remember, if you do go urban exploring, bring something to defend yourself. If I hadn't had my knife in hand, I may not have been here to type this story. Never walk alone on a wooded road, because you'll find something, or something will find you, that will change your life forever. My legs were exhausted. I'd been walking along that dark, wooded road for about three hours by then, and my body was ready to call it quits. I missed the luxury of my car, but it had broken down several miles back, and my phone... It was dead. It had been dead since I got in the car. I was never very good about keeping my things charged, but at that time, I hated myself for it. I wanted to be home, warm in my bed, but I wouldn't even be close to my town for another three or four hours. About halfway there, I reminded myself, trying to keep the spirits up. I should have stayed in the car, part of me thought, Honestly, I only got out of the car, thinking that if I began walking, I could wave someone down and hitch a ride. But, for the past three hours, not one person had stopped. In fact, not one person had passed by. It was the most quiet I'd ever seen this road. That was really saying something. I was very familiar with this place, as well as attached to it. Not only was it the quickest route to my grandparents' place, but it was also a place that my dad and I spent a lot of time in. There were miles upon miles of hiking trails in those woods, trails my dad and I were well acquainted with. Not only that, but I remember one occasion when my dad and I were driving back home from my grandparents, and on this very road, my dad encountered an injured deer. He stopped the car on the side of the road in hopes of helping the poor creature. I remember being so little, wondering what the two of us could do for an injured deer. 
I stayed in the car and watched through the windshield. The next thing I knew, my dad stood up, and so did the deer, which began to walk away, but stopped only for a moment to look back at my dad, as if to acknowledge the help. Then it turned and disappeared into the woods. When my dad walked back into the car, I asked him what he did. He said he had found a piece of glass in one of its hooves. How that deer got glass in his hoof, I don't know. But that day was a memory of my father that I would hold on to and cherish for the rest of my life. My father had been a good and kind man and a great dad. Sure, he and my mother fought a lot when I was a kid, but they loved each other dearly, passionately. Opposites attract, they say. And I do realize that my dad was never the same after my mom walked out on us when I was younger. But in spite of his faults and everything he's ever done for me, I love and miss that man. Because when I turned 14, my dad passed away. I miss him dearly. Ever since then, I cherished my time driving on this road and walking in the woods around it. Thinking about my father as I walked along the dark road, I was suddenly reminded about a particular negative memory, a specific part of this road that my dad was always wary of. You see, there was this portion of the road. It wasn't much different from the other parts of it, save for one thing, a near ancient stump that had been there for as long as I could remember. The part of the stump that faced the road, it was covered in fungus and moss. I noticed that insects would land on that side with ease. The other side, facing the woods, it was all dark and rotted, a disgusting color between gray and brown that no natural living thing should be. Yet despite that half of it looking so awful, it never did cave in or fall away never did seem to rot away at all. It always looked like if you kicked it real good on that side, it would just smush in on itself, like some sort of old soggy log. But I never dared try, never dared get close to it. I had no reason to be afraid of the stump. It was only because of my dad's fear that drove me to inherit it. As I said before, my dad and I would walk in these woods, even along the roads, but every time we'd come close to this stump, he would lead me away from it, taking a much larger detour so as to not come close to it. I even saw his wariness of it when we drove down this road. He wouldn't look at it, and he would stay completely quiet during that segment. No matter how much I tried to push him into a conversation, or even ask why he was so weird about that stump, he would stay quiet until he could no longer see it in his rear view. And if he was driving towards it and saw it coming up in the distance, he would quickly speed up a good 10 or 15 miles per hour just to get past it more quickly. And as I remembered that old stump, I also recalled that I hadn't passed it yet and I would be coming up on it soon enough. I continued to walk and walk and walk becoming more and more creeped out as I got closer to it. Then again, walking alone on a dark road at night, getting a little bit creeped out is sort of inevitable. About 20 minutes later, I saw its silhouette forming in the distance in front of me. Of course, I was walking on the same side of the road as it. I hadn't even thought about that. I walked a little faster now, mirroring my dad's actions when he used to see the stump. I even instinctively tried to avoid looking at it directly. But as I began to remember my dad and think of him more, I began to feel more and more empowered, silly, thinking that surely my dad wouldn't want me scared of the stump as well. Besides, it could have just been me reading too much into things when I was younger. I was at a full sprint, ignoring my sore legs. About two minutes later, I was standing right in front of the thing. It hadn't changed a bit. The left side where the road was, was lush with color. It was thick with moss and fungus, alive with nighttime insects, 
A moth rested on one of the mushrooms. A snail searched for food under one of the mushroom caps. And a firefly light strobed on one of the patches of moss. I turned my head only slightly. Even now, the dark side of the stump appeared ready to collapse at any moment. I thought to myself, I could probably just breathe on it, and the wood would fall in. Would probably be doing people favors, so they wouldn't have to look at that nasty side of the stump from now on. With a sigh and a smirk, I walked over to that side of the thing. I felt way too confident. Here sat this thing that my father was afraid of for so long. Maybe, just maybe, I might do him a favor. I took a couple of steps back, then got a decent running start. Placing all of my weight into my left foot, I kicked at the side of the rotten end of the stump. For some reason, I expected it to be rough, hard, expected my kick to have no effect, as if there was some sort of magical property to this dang stump. But when my foot made contact, I could barely feel anything. It was like kicking a big wet sponge. A landslide of bark flew off of the thing. The rotten side of the stump nearly separating itself perfectly from the lush side. I smiled for a moment, catching my breath after the sudden outburst. I looked down at the mush of old bark, and before I could feel triumph at what I had done, I covered my mouth and held back a scream. There, under the bark that I had just kicked, there was a hand, a withered hand nearly the same color as that rotten wood around it. Horrified, I dropped to the ground. I couldn't believe what I was looking at. I found myself crawling closer, needing to know if it was really a human hand that was poking through the soil. I crawled with utter reluctance toward the stump, or what remained of it, driven only by morbid curiosity. When I was next to it, I began to dig and pull at the soil that was loose with my hands. As I revealed more of what was underneath, I stopped, now unable to breathe. It was a face, withered just as much as the hand if not more but a face that was recognizable nonetheless. A face I recognized. It was my mother. I wanted to throw up. I wanted to kill over right then and there. To be lost to that wooded road, like my mother apparently. And as my mind could not form a proper thought, as if on cue by some higher power who had been waiting for me to make this discovery, an old pickup truck drove by, saw me on the side of the road, and stopped. An old man asked me if I was okay. I couldn't even look at him. But sure enough, he followed my gaze to the stump. He cursed under his breath, running back to his truck to grab his phone and call the police. Later on, forensics revealed that it was in fact my mother. My mother who never ran away. My mother who never abandoned us. My mother who had been killed by my father and buried under this old tree stump. I now know why my dad feared it, and I can't help but wonder if that side of the stump rotted like that as a signal. One last cry for help from my late mom. Number one, Creature on the Edge, submitted by Alan. I am a 16-year-old male. My name is Alan. I tend to think of myself as a pretty logical guy. I have always been aware of my senses and I guess a little paranoid. And I think that if I didn't have the following traits, I might not be here to tell this tale. When I was about 15, me and my friend who we'll call Jack 
We're biking through a very narrow, desolate road in the more unknown areas of Colorado. I'd rather not reveal the exact location, but the road was one of the more typical roads you would see in a more desolate area. A small, narrow one composed of mainly dirt, and all along the sides of it, a very thick tree line that gets thicker as you move along. While biking on these roads, we always were a little creeped out, but that just added a little more kick to the ride. But on this day, we never thought that anything like this could happen to such simple people like us. Well, I guess no one ever expects something to happen like this. We had been biking for about two hours and would take quick pauses to drink some water or take a bite of our snacks we had packed, the usual stuff. While taking these small breaks, nothing really ever happened, but on this particular day, we didn't take too many pauses because we could hear weird noises coming from around us. But after almost three hours of riding, we had to take a break. So we found a pretty big log to park our bikes at and we sat down to catch our breath. After about five minutes or so, we heard what sounded like a woman scream. As far as I could tell, it was at least 400 yards away from us, to the left. A couple of 15-year-old boys like us wanted nothing more than to show our macho selves as we went to investigate. We walked around for at least 20 minutes, but we found nothing. When we got back, we found our bikes completely destroyed. I mean, the chain was in pieces, the tires were slashed, and the gear shift was ripped right off the handlebars. My stomach dropped, and I almost felt like puking, but then I thought maybe it was just some jerk passing by. But no less than a minute of investigating, we heard something that sounded like a big piece of wood being smashed across a tree trunk. It was very loud and sudden, but I slowly turned around and saw something that could only be described as a creature. It had a height of at least six feet. Its whole body was covered in hair and a large snout that went down to its mid chest and had strange wire-like appendages on its chin, followed by two small black beady eyes and at the top of its head were weird large curled horns. My friend and I took no time to think. We both ran as fast as we could, making sharp turns to try to disorient this creature from following us. We are not sure if it chased us at all, but all I know is that as soon as we started running, it produced two of the most strangest and creepiest sounds I've ever heard. They almost sounded like a pig and eagle combined. I know it sounds weird, but it was terrifying. As we ran, we got to a nearby road where we quickly called up my dad to come get us. We never told him the full story. We just told him that our bikes had been stolen when we went to use the bathroom. To this day, I never figured out what I saw and I don't go hiking or biking anymore on desolate trails as much, but instead stick to more populated areas. But to this creepy creature from the woods, let's not meet again. Number two, Cannibal in the Forest, submitted by Caden. This happened around June or July this year. My cousin and I were both 13 years old and we live in Louisiana. My cousin and I decided to go ride my golf cart around the neighborhood. We do this every time she comes over, so it quickly got boring just doing little circles around the neighborhood all the time. So we stopped at a dry ditch on the road my house was on. I parked the golf cart at the end of my neighbor's driveway that we already felt uneasy about. We once heard what sounded like screaming coming from their yard. Anyway, we got out of the golf cart and took a peek down the ditch to see if there was anything interesting. I saw some old planks of wood lining the side of the ditch about six feet in. We decided it was enough to spark our interest and we jumped in. As we walked along the ditch, we heard some rustling beside us, but we thought nothing of it, as it could have just been a deer or a raccoon or something like that. We got about 30 feet into the ditch and I saw an open area, so we decided to take a hike to get to the other side of it, but we continued until we entered a wet part of the ditch. It was full of mosquitoes, so we decided to end our hike and head back home before it got dark. Both my cousin and I were amazed at how large this ditch really was, and I told her sister about it. The next day, we went back to what we now called the grotto. We made sure to wear outdoor shoes for better grip. Once we entered, the rustling we heard yesterday was back, but this time it was closer. It was louder. We hiked our way through the open area again, looking out for anyone who might be in the woods with us, since, again, it was very close to our weird neighbor's house. When we made our way through the wet part, we climbed our way out of the ditch and into the woods where the sound was coming from, like the idiots we were. But everyone has a bit of curiosity, right? 
it seemed like every step we took, spiders would crawl out from under the leaves, almost like something out of a horror movie. We even found a bag of marijuana in someone's hiding place, along with some empty glass bottles and old ripped up shoes. When I saw those shoes though, I wanted to leave as soon as possible, but my cousin wanted to keep exploring. We came upon a fallen tree with a pile of fresh trash covering it. I then began to make my way back to the ditch, that is, until my cousin yelled at me. I, I found something. I then ran back to where she was and she pointed to a pile of bones. Immediately, we assumed they were that of a small kid, but we did not find the skull, so they could have been animal bones too. When you're creeped out like that, you always assume the worst. We walked closer to inspect the bones, but we heard the sound of someone stomping around us, and it made us both jump. We turned toward the noise, and what we saw was truly horrifying. It was a man with long, dirty hair and bloody fingernails, crouched down like an animal. Luckily, he was running away from us. We must have stumbled upon his spot for something. But strangely, he stopped behind a tree and began to stare at us. We ran back to the golf cart, horrified as to what we might have happened upon. To this day, I haven't and never will look or drive down the road with the ditch we explored. My cousin and I never discussed the event with each other, and we never told anyone about it. Number 3. Troll on the Mountain Submitted by Sander I live in and have a cabin in Norway. I've been wanting to tell my story for so long. I swear I saw something one day I would call a troll. Me and four of my family members were going on a long peaceful walk to a mountaintop. We are big nature lovers, so we were enjoying the colors of nature all too much. And being the one that enjoyed long walks and hiking, I was really looking forward to this. During our little hike, along the way, we saw a rabbit running away from this animal. It was very big, maybe three to five feet tall, but we did not get a very good look at it from there. We kept walking, enjoying ourselves and having a good time. Eventually, we made it to the top of the mountain. It was absolutely beautiful. But as we were looking around, I saw in the distance something big. It took me a moment, but it seemed to be the same thing I saw before, but this time it had something in its hands. I can't say for sure, but it was the same size and shape as a rabbit. It sounded like it was muttering something, maybe even chanting, until it crushed the rabbit's head. I gasped loud, surprised and disgusted. The thing had long greenish hair and a large nose. It wore other animal skins around its body and I would guess it was trying to get warm in the cold weather. Sure enough, the thing looked at us. It saw us, probably because it heard me gasping so loud. It screamed in our direction. That freaking scream, it was like a combination of a reindeer and a dying sheep, if that makes any sense. It was awful. Its eyes were glowing yellow, and its mouth had many disformed teeth, and on the other side of its face, it had the faces of crying children. I wanted to throw up just looking at this weird thing. We all rushed down the mountainside in a panic, pushing past each other, trying to get through. I can say that after that night, I've been pretty spooked, and I swear, every so often I can hear that thing out in the woods screaming and chanting. Remember, whenever you go walking, whether you're going on a mountain trip or hiking alone, you really aren't ever alone. Number four, the skinwalker that followed us. Submitted by Backwoodsman78. Before I go and tell this story, I want to make sure to all of you listening that these things are real, including this story. Me and my friend had decided to go hunting out in a new spot. This new spot was almost about four miles from my house. We were dropped off by my dad just a mile in to sort of reduce the walk, but it still turned out to be a bit of a hike. But luckily, this far out, we wouldn't scare the deer off. It was around 5.20 in the morning when we got in and started walking. But as I looked up and along the tree line, I saw a tall figure standing there. I assumed it was just a configuration of trees and branches. You know, how human eyes make out familiar shapes and things. I didn't say anything to my friend. I just simply assumed it was branches. Not even going 30 yards in front of me, I heard a noise up the steep bank that caught my attention. And as I looked up, I saw something I had only heard of. It had to be about six foot four or five because I'm six foot two. I immediately got behind a tree as I thought to myself, maybe it's just another hunter. 
But the real dread came when I realized we were right now around five miles in from an actual road and we were nowhere near someone else's property line. I had preloaded a 308 caliber full metal jacket round in my Remington. I told my friend that I did not care who or what it was, but if it came down to it, it was going to be dead. We sat for around three minutes and this thing began to walk down the side of the mountain towards us, seemingly unafraid. I ended up getting a closer look at the thing. It was tall, skinny, and what really gave it away in my mind was that it had this hat on its head. I knew what it was as soon as my eyes hit it. It was the snout and fur of a coyote. Whoever this was was wearing the fur of a coyote. My blood ran cold and so did my trigger finger. I was just completely paralyzed in fear and amazement that this was what me and my friend were really seeing. I didn't wait any longer. I threw up my Remington and shot at it. And as the bullet hit, you could hear this god awful noise come out of it. I really can't describe it, but it was between a panther and an elk. After that, we hiked back to the nearest road and quickly made our way out of those woods. To this day, I have never returned to that side of the property, nor that road, but me and my friends still do speak about what we saw that morning. I'm not sure what it was or what it was wanting. All I know for sure is that there is no way in hell that that thing was human. Number five, The Trail, submitted by Hammond. It was sometime in August. I decided to go for a hike that would last till about 11 at night. I was a bit nervous for my upcoming exams and hiking takes off the nerves. There was a parking lot near where I wanted to hike and as I entered, there were only about three cars there and one was really shaggy looking with dents all over. There was a man, maybe in his 40s, just sitting there staring at me as I went onto the trail. About a half hour into the hike, I see him taking a different trail, but he stops and stares at me once again. It was starting to get dark. It must have been 9 p.m., and that's when I heard leaves crunching behind me. I turned toward the noise with my flashlight on, and to my surprise, there was no one there. It was getting late. I decided to head back. The parking lot itself was 30 minutes away, so I guess it was time to go. I was getting close to the parking lot entrance when I hear running behind me. I quickly begin running myself and take a peek behind me, and there was that scraggy, dirty man holding a cloth in his hand and some sort of spray bottle. At this point, I am making a mad dash to my car, reaching for my keys to get in as fast as possible, and I did it just in time. This psychotic man reached for the door handle, and I looked at it, jammed the keys into the ignition and got the hell out of there. In the rear view mirror, I watched as this man, this insane man, ran after my car with no success. I floored it out of there. The last thing I saw in my mirror was him bolting into the woods. I immediately reached for my phone to call 911 and from there on, I have no idea what happened to the guy. I hope that sicko got arrested or they did something about it. God knows where or who he is and who else he might have gotten his hands on. And number six, Yukon Creature, submitted by Sailor Man. I am an avid hiker. I had last year went to Northern Canada on a hiking expedition for a week. I was retelling this story to one of my friends last week and they suggested that I needed to share it as it seemed to be unusual and maybe he was right as I assume there are people out there with a lot of experiences. Now, my friends, significant other, and I were up in the northern part of Canada, the location I will not disclose as I've always worried about internet stalkers and the such. Anyway, we continued along, riding in a big truck, the five of us. The rear of this truck had been decked out with a top cover and a passage into the front which you could crawl through. It was really meant for skis, but we didn't bring them. It was a clear winter night as me and my friends played Magic the Gathering in the back, or at least attempted to. We thought it'd be funny, a bunch of people in the middle of nowhere doing the nerdiest thing possible. A few beers went around and we continued. It was a really great time. One of my friends shouted to look at something at one point. He was an avid naturalist and tried to get us to help him identify what we were seeing. My spouse and I put down our card game and we turned to look at what he was shouting at. Looking through the windows, we could see the silhouette of a moose or elk off in the distance, but the figure quickly disappeared as we continued to drive off. And honestly, it was pretty exciting to see this animal. It was the first find of the trip. We kept going on as this was the second day into the trip 
We'd stop to camp on Wednesday and head back over the next week to civilization. A few hours later, Dave stopped the car to sleep, as most of us were getting really tired. Short of me, as I still had work to do, even though I was technically on vacation. My job really required me to keep working, or well, I couldn't really stop working. I'm not sure if it was personal or some sense of pride to keep working, but I kept on anyway. Dave mumbled something, but I ignored him, mostly because I could not hear him over the music in my headphones. I kept working, when maybe 20 minutes later, I could hear his voice barely over the music. I pulled off my headphones as I looked away from the laptop. He was sleeping. In fact, everyone in there was asleep. I looked behind me out the window, but there was no one and nothing out there. Sparse trees gave off thin shadows that were barely visible through the moonlight. I travel a lot, and nothing is just a noise. From a whisper in the airport to a bird's call in a rural city, it's all valuable information as I've found. I continued to work, but this time without music. After a good five minutes, my spouse wakes up. She looks up at me and asks me to keep it down. I tell her I've been dead silent. I decided to take a shift driving as it was something to do, and I was done taking notes for now. Starting up the car, taking a quick head count to make sure I've not forgotten anyone, everyone was there and I started off. I glanced in my rearview mirror and I saw that deer again, but this time all I could make out was the antlers as its head was down and the body was hidden behind a tree. I remember this exactly because it was dimly illuminated in the moonlight. Although I thought seeing the deer was cool, I kept driving across the snowy ground. Over the next day, we were almost to our camping spot. We spotted this horned animal a few times more as well. Sure, it could have been several different animals and we didn't mind. I thought it was a little unusual, but I brushed it off as I'm pretty skeptical. That night, we set up camp, which meant assembling the rooftop tent, a mechanical nightmare that somehow made a tent that attached to the roof of the truck. My friend Dave had built it, as it was his truck and he was more serious about roughing it out there more than we were. My friend stayed in the tent while me and my spouse were given the truck bed, partially out of respect and partially out of a desire to sleep in the luxurious truck tent. That night, being a little excited, I decided to go for a walk. My spouse, though, exhausted, decided to sleep. I took my machete with me, although the blade was used to cutting down foliage. An occasional pine branch was no issue. After a while, I started to hear my spouse calling my name. I could still see the lights of the truck, even out from a distance, so I began to walk back to the truck. But that's when I noticed that the call was coming away from the truck. So I stopped and listened, confused and I noticed that her voice was exactly the same every time, like the looping of audio. This freaked me out a lot. I booked it back to the truck, and I started it up, which although you're not supposed to run the truck with a tent on top, it was bolted down pretty heavily and the path ahead was clear, so I didn't worry about getting the tent knocked off. Scared and speeding away, I noticed this deer thing charging the truck, managing to keep pace with it somehow. It let out this horrific wail, and I could not describe how terrible it was. I broke down crying as the guy started to bang on the roof of the truck to tell me to stop. I crossed the stream, the bumpy rocks probably banged up my friend's truck pretty good, not to mention my friends themselves. Suddenly I heard a gunshot, then a second, and a third. And then it stopped. After five more minutes of driving, I stopped at the end of this clearing. The thing was no longer following us. My friends climbed down, packed up the tent, and told me to freaking drive. I looked back, and my spouse's face was glued to the window. She turned toward me for a moment, and her face was covered in tears. She was terrified. She was not one for horror movies, and she always cried and got scared of them. I drove off as my friend and I rode in deathly silence for the next four hours until the sun came up. That morning, we finally all stopped and talked about what happened. I told my bit. None of us knew exactly what had happened, but my friend Sean gave the most reasonable explanation about a moose with rabies or something like that. This kind of thing happened as we all agreed. However, we could not explain how it ran so fast as to keep up with the truck, or as my friends described it, its face looked mangled. None of us knew what had happened, and we agreed to end our trip early, making a detour to hit a couple of villages on our way back instead of the now terrifying scenic route. We did have a great time on the rest of the trip, and we met some very nice people. We never bothered to ask anyone else about it, as we assumed they'd probably be as clueless as we were, or at least I never asked, and if the others did, they never bothered to tell the rest of us the result. 
To be honest, I am not a believer of this rabies story because not one bit does it explain how I heard my spouse's exact voice coming from the woods away from where she was and looping the exact sound over and over. Don't leave the campfire. Went camping in a cold, damp national park in the Northwest United States. I'm used to going camping alone, hiking alone. Never been good around people. I'd take my dogs, Tex, a big German shepherd, and Gruff, my old geriatric pug. Gruff could barely see four feet in front of him. Never wandered too far from me. But Tex was pretty darn independent but he was scared of the woods. He was a big dog, and the way he'd hug up against my legs as we walked the trails made it difficult to hike. Tex did love the vistas, though. Once the woods opened up into clearings or cliffs, he'd always be excited. He just didn't like those trees and shadows, I guess. But those two ain't around anymore, and I don't go hiking anymore. Let me tell you why. Might be best to click away now if you ain't a fan of animals getting hurt. Let me get back to how I was camping in a cold, damp national park in the northwest United States, specifically in the Rockies. It was close to winter and was as cold as you'd imagine. I'd bought Tex and Gruff the coziest little vests I could find and I made sure we stayed real close to a big campfire by the tent. I couldn't do as much hiking as I wanted. A cold front had me thinking we'd probably call it quits early. We kept the tent set up close to the fire. Tex was asleep in the tents under some blankets he'd snuggled into, and Gruff was sniffing around the site, seeing what sort of smells he could find. I kept an eye on him. His sense of smell was as good as ever, far as I could tell, but he was nearly blind and might wander off too far. Not because he wanted to, but because he wasn't too sure where he was going. I lay back on a wad of blankets, starting to doze off myself. Gruff snorted. I raised up and looked at him. Gruff had lost his bark years ago. Now all he could do was sort of grunt and snort. Couldn't hear it from a different room had we been back at the house, but out here in the dead of night, it was clear as crystal. Looking over, he was just sitting there, peering into the woods. What you see, boy? I asked, not actually expecting an answer the way dog owners do. I'm not sure he heard me, though. He didn't react. Kept staring into the dark. Tex whimpered behind me, apparently awake now. Nearly jumped out of my skin when I heard it. I looked toward him, and he was scurrying backward into the tent wall. What the heck? I looked toward the darkness now, too, wondering what these dogs were seeing or sensing that I couldn't. Started thinking about dogs' visual range. They see through the dark better than we can. Imagining a possum that I couldn't see... Waddling through the dark nearly had me laugh. Gruff was curious, and Tex was a big baby, just like always. But then Gruff got back up on his back legs, seemed curious, and he began to walk forward. Gruff, no, I called to him. He knew better than to go too far. A quick reminder should do the trick. But he ignored me. So I called again. Gruffy, get back here. I began to pick myself up to go and carry him back. Gruff went further forward, paw by paw, until the light from the campfire couldn't reach him. The next thing I knew, there was a muffled yelp, the sound of something big swatting or slapping at the ground. My eyes shot over toward that direction. I'd only looked away for a moment to pick myself up, and Gruff was gone. Only thing left was a cloud of dirt that had been kicked up. I swallowed hard. Felt as if my heart was rising up in my throat. I felt mad too, but also scared. 
Where was my dog? Tex was going mad then, clawing desperately at the back of the inside of the tent, trying to rip a hole through it. T Tex, no! Lay down! I tried to command him to calm down. He wasn't having it. Started using his teeth on the nylon. I was panicking too. Had no idea what to do or where Gruff had gone. I tried to crawl over to Tex slowly. Thought I could pet him and ease him into letting me leash him up to one of the stakes. Then I could go look for Gruff and bring him back. I placed my hand on his back. But then Tex snaps, yelping and digging his teeth into my hand before continuing to gnaw at the tent. I fall back, cursing. I looked at my hand, and he had drawn blood. The heck was wrong with him? He had never attacked me before. Matter of fact, I'd never seen him bite another living thing like that. He then tore through the fabric after a few more seconds. I couldn't stop him. He tried to jump through the hole then, but as he did, a similar smack or swatting sound echoed from just outside the tent. Tex's body went limp. I couldn't see more than his lower half because the rest of him was already outside the tent because he was trying to escape. Tex, come here, boy. Y you okay? I called over to him. Suddenly, his body was yanked through the hole entirely, unimaginably fast. Bile rose in my throat. Soon I realized I was choking rather than breathing. I crawled instinctively closer to the campfire. The forest around me was silent. There were bugs chirping and wind blowing through the trees, but nothing else. No sign of movement around the campsite. No sign of anything wrong, except for my two missing dogs. I quickly crawled over to where Gruff had gone, fumbling my phone out of my pocket turning on the flashlight. I followed Gruff's little paw prints until they stopped. Where he had disappeared was the set of thick indentations in the dirt. It reminded me of something. I placed my hand, palm down in the dirt beside me, squeezing some dirt in my hand and lifting it up. The shapes I left in the dirt below looked the same, but way smaller. It was as if a far larger hand had done the same thing to my dog. To both dogs. Out of breath, I circled the camp with the light, pointing it in every direction, but there was nothing but trees. It didn't make sense. I turned off the flashlight and dialed my wife. She didn't answer. Two times, three times, a dozen times I called. No answer. Then I dialed 911. The operator picked up. I informed them that I was in the Rockies. Someone attacked and possibly killed my dogs and might still be out there trying to hurt me. But then a familiar tone sounded in my ear. I looked at the phone screen and a phone brand logo was animating. My phone had died. It was shutting down. I cursed under my breath several times crawling again, not sure why I was too scared to stand up, as I tried to find my backpack. I soon find it, but I can't find my mobile charger, which was supposed to be in there. No, 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 I think. I left it at home, didn't I? I stayed close to the fire then, not blinking for minutes at a time, my head like a sprinkler shifting back and forth, back and forth, ready for anything to emerge from the dark and come right at me. But it never did. I stayed in the same spot, trying not to doze off. It blew my mind that my body was still trying to fall asleep after seeing something like this. The fire behind me was dying down to embers and orange coals. Then I hear movement. My heart rate spikes up again. I look up. Something shoots right past me, landing in front of me at the edge of the firelight. It's an owl, thank God. I can see it more clearly. My eyes have adjusted pretty well, and the moon shining through the canopy was a godsend. 
The owl looks at me with those big eyes. Not sure what it was doing down here until I noticed a mouse struggling between its talons. I guess it wasn't in too much of a hurry to fly back up and have that snack. I watched as the mouse broke free from the owl. The owl's head turns and follows the mouse as it runs towards the darkness. The owl's wings open up as it awkwardly pursued the rodent, and then smack. I see it this time. It's much closer than Gruff had been when it happened. A massive hand came down, pointed at the tips like claws. It swept up the bird and mouse, both, before pulling away. This hand was attached to a long, spindly arm with tiny, sharp offshoots, and attached to that was a thin and a rigid body. This body pulls the hand inwards until there's a nearly inaudible crunching sound, and then the silhouette of the thing goes motionless. I realized then that the outline of the creature looked perfectly like a tree in the dark. I was panicking all over again. There were trees everywhere. There could be many of those things everywhere around me. Or if there was one, that I might lose track of it, and it could be anywhere. I stopped and took a breather. I had another realization. That thing seemed to only reach for things away from the fire. I couldn't leave. I was trapped here. I had to get the fire going again, too, before it died out completely. But I could not venture into the forest for what. I glanced over to my blankets and backpack in the tent. I did what I had to do. The pack and fabrics made a billow of smoke as they blazed, but they stayed lit for far longer than I expected. I managed to keep the fire blazing until sunrise. When the sun was shining in full force, I picked myself up, didn't grab anything except for my dead phone, and I scanned the tree line. All the trees looked like trees. That was enough for me to break into a full-on run, and I didn't stop until I was forced to collapse on one of the trails. And there I was found by some hikers. People like me. Or, rather, people who had no idea what sort of nightmares actually lurk in those woods. I managed to make it out, unsure of what I'd seen, vowing never to go back. When I made it home, I cried, letting my wife know that something out there had attacked and killed our dogs. When she asked what it was, I told her my honest truth. I don't know. But I'll let you know that if you're ever in the Rockies, you find yourself out there after dark. Stay by the campfire. And don't let it die out. Werewolf Sighting from the Mad Miller in spring of last year, there have been reports from sheep farmers along the Dutch-German border, especially in the eastern Dutch provinces and way down in the southeast of the country. These shepherds have reported several cases of their sheep, and on some occasions even their sheepdogs, being slaughtered, but not eaten. These cases have been on the news several times, for if the killers would have been wolves like many suspected... They were displaying some off behavior. Namely, wolves don't just kill their prey and leave it behind. Nor would they consider fighting one or several sheepdogs on a normal occasion. And lastly, they would never invade human territory, especially not on their own. Not to mention the territory was being guarded by dogs and electric fences in the meadows. Still, there have been reportings of sheep and sheepdogs being killed and sometimes being partially eaten. In the southeast, there were 11 sheep, six of which were lambs, slaughtered, but left untouched beyond that. There was no trace found of the killer, 
save for the deep tooth marks in the torn throats of the dead sheep, as well as one paw print with a length of about seven inches. After those killings, there was a period of silence, until there came new reports of the killings in the east having been done by wolves. This was said to have been confirmed by DNA tests coming from the bite marks on the dead sheep. Roughly a year later, there is now a small pack of wolves living on the biggest Dutch national park, Belua, and there have been no more reports of sheep being killed, not in the news anyway. The killer of the 11 sheep in the southeast has also been confirmed to have been a wolf, but this was never supported by DNA results or further arguments other than young wolves that are looking for a territory to kill sheep on farms to show other wolves who's boss. But this contradicts the statement that wolves wouldn't dare to approach human settlements guarded by dogs and an electric fence. It was all quite suspicious. I loved going into the woods at nightfall, so much so that I've done it at least three times this year, though visiting a forest after sunset or before dawn is still illegal here. I would often take a short walk right before sunset and leave when it was almost completely dark, wearing dark clothes, so the foresters or creepy people would not spot me easily. I don't know why I'm addicted to hikes, especially nocturnal hikes in the woods. I felt a really strong call of the wild, if you'd call it that, ever since the first time I went off trail in the summer of 2017. When I go out to visit the woods, either going off trail or not, not even the time of day matters. I'm always energetic and excited about it. I would even dare to say that I wanted to go hunting on some occasions. I would feel the urge to hunt when I'd see a deer or rabbit run by but I have neither a license nor weapons, so I'm pretty sure I wouldn't be able to do any of that. A few weeks ago, as of writing this, at the start of autumn, I went for another night hike in the forest. I had to bring my flashlight since it was cloudy and rainy outside. As always, I went there on my mountain bike, chaining it to a pole before I'd set off into the darkness between the trees. I saw the last people walking back to their cars and homes, as I walked into the opposite direction. It had become completely dark when I made it to the middle of the forest. I silently enjoyed the cold, the scents and sounds of the woods, and I had nearly forgotten about my encounter in these same woods almost two years ago. After having set myself down on a wooden bench nearby, I heard the faint bleeding of sheep from about 200 meters away from me. I stood up and began to walk in the direction of the noise, mostly because the bleeding sounded rather distressed, as if the sheep were panicking and trying to flee from something. I was already surprised that I could hear it from that far away anyway, but what surprised me at least just as much was that I could smell the scent of the sheep as well. The wind was blowing in my direction, but still, I didn't know I was capable of this. I should mention it's quite normal to encounter a flock of sheep here in these woods, as local shepherds have their sheep stay in several places to control the weeds growing there. One day you might find them on the moor, and the other day you'd find them stationed near the bank of a lake. A low, fairly easily removable makeshift electric fence would hold the sheep from wandering off and losing the flock. Tonight, the flock had been placed on a small moor, about 200 meters from where I sat on a bench. It took me some time walking toward the pen before I could see the sheep, as the flock was hidden by bushes from my direction. Though what I saw when I arrived at the pen kind of shocked me, because not only were the animals running around frantically, trying to escape, but there were two slaughtered sheep lying in a small puddle of blood. I could see that their throats had been torn open by jaws that seemed bigger than those of a dog or even a wolf. There were no signs of the fence having been touched, though. What I did notice were a scramble of enormous canine-looking paw prints around the sheep's corpses and around the pen. 
as if the killer had carefully been walking around at first, meticulously choosing its prey before stepping inside and making its move. The sight was, of course, shocking and terrifying, but weirdly enough, not for me. I wasn't as shocked and scared as I'd expected myself to be. Instead, I felt more frustrated. Frustrated about someone or something having been roaming around in my woods, causing a disturbance. I had begun to see these woods as my second home. As much of a reckless idiot as I was, I decided to follow the tracks. I was curious to see who or what was roaming the forest at night. If I wouldn't have known better, I would have realized that I might have just been walking into the jaws of death soon enough. I kept following the huge tracks until the trees surrounding me made the environment hard to see. I changed my mind as I could no longer see much at this point, the trees blocking out pretty much every possible light entering my eyes. So I whipped out my flashlight and shone it around, while I could still hear the sheep panicking in the distance, just maybe 55 meters behind me. I was suddenly on edge again when a new scent hit my nose, a scent which seemed to be a mix of wet dog and fresh blood. This would soon be accompanied by footsteps on the forest floor, calm steps, as if something was walking up to me to check me out. I directed my flashlight toward where the scent and sound was coming from, and what I saw first were eyes, gold-yellow eyes, about four feet above the ground. Now this already meant that whatever it was was bigger than a dog, bigger than a wolf even. I froze as the beast stepped closer, and at this moment I could make out its face and front view of its body. It was similar to a wolf, though in proportion slightly bigger and sturdier. Its fur was dark on its back and lighter on its belly. It even seemed to have a short, dark mane on its neck. The animal appeared to be staring at me cautiously, but it didn't seem to be aggressive yet. From the blood on its snout, I could tell that it must have been the beast that killed those sheep. And now, I was indeed scared. Any sudden moves or panic that I could not control could mean the death of me. It wasn't like I stood much of a chance against a beast this big. Still showing no aggression, the creature came closer until it stood about five meters away from me. Then, as I stood there watching in utter awe and silence, the creature stood up on two legs, like a bear, now towering over me at about seven feet in height. I felt the hairs on the back of my neck stand up, and I took a more sturdy, defensive stance. I had to constantly remind myself not to show fear. It leaned forward a little and sniffed the air to smell my scent. It then perked its ears up, seemingly more suspicious of me. All I knew was that the bigger you appear to certain creatures, the less likely you are to be attacked. But no matter what I did, this thing would be looking down on me. Still, I tried to make the best of the situation, trying not to look intrigued or scared. This, as if by some miracle, seemed to work. The wolf-like thing stepped backward slightly, breaking eye contact with me. I took a tiny step forward and tried to look defensive or territorial. As I appeared to have the upper hand now, I did something ballsy. I spoke to it, trying to sound fearsome and demanding. My woods. Get out. Again, I was genuinely surprised that this happened to work. The beast turned its head away from me and growled softly, what seemed to sound like a protest. It then went down on all fours and turned around to disappear into the darkness. Before it completely vanished from sight, it gave me one last awfully human-looking glance, 
its eyes reflecting the beam of my flashlight. As soon as I could no longer see, hear, or smell the wolf, I let out a sigh of relief, so loud that I was afraid the wolf would still hear me and that it would come back. Only then did I start shivering, my mind and body at once realizing I had just survived a life-or-death encounter with an animal beyond the normal, something that reminded me an awful lot of a werewolf. Cold shivers poured down my spine, and I grew a little nauseous when I was suddenly startled by a piercing but distant howl coming from behind me. It was both beautiful and haunting, reminding me of the howl from a game I used to play called The Hunter Classic. The sound chilled me to the bone, and all I wanted then was to get the heck out of those woods, back to my home. After about 20 minutes of speed walking back to my bike and continuously looking around me and pausing, cautiously peering into the darkness at every sound I heard, I made it back to my bike. Quickly, I unlocked it and raced home. Back at home, the realization hit me again. I might as well have been as dead and torn up as one of those sheep. When I calmed down, the questions started coming in too. Why didn't it attack me? Why did it react like that when it sniffed me? What's also strange is I haven't heard anything in the news, even the local news, about the slaughtered sheep I discovered. It's as if it never happened, with perhaps even the shepherd completely denying that his flock lost two of its members to a supernatural predator. All I know is that I won't be telling anybody in my family or friend group about my experience. If it comes up in the news, I'm sure people will just think it's a wolf, just like it happened with all the other sheep killings in the Netherlands over the past two years. And I'll be quitting my nocturnal walks in the woods for sure. Because next time I encounter something like that, I may not be so lucky.